Okay, thank you, Tim. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the 144th meeting of the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. Um, my name is Rick Kaufman, currently the president of the Fish and Boat Commission. And uh, again, I'd like to welcome and thank everybody for joining us this morning. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Yvonne Greer for roll call. Um, oh, we're gonna do Pledge of Allegiance first, okay? So everybody rise, face the flag in the corner. I pledge allegiance to the flag, United States of America, public for which it stands, nation, God, indivisible, liberty, justice for all. Okay. All righty. Roll call, Yvonne. Present. 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 Thank you. Next, we're gonna move into public comments and we do have some folks here. First, I'm gonna call on Nick Sampson and we're going to give you three minutes and um, please go to the front. Yeah, Mike has right. the right. microphone and uh, we welcome you and thank you for coming. My name is Nick Sampson. I'm the current PA state rep for the Bow Fishing Association of America. Uh, oh, no problem. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak on the behalf of the Bow Fishing Association and much of the Bow Fishing community. Uh, first off, I want to thank you for the possibility of uh, opening some of our approved trout waters you know, for thousands and thousands of licensed men and women for even more activities, you know, in the many miles of waters that we have here in PA. In regards to the proposal um, uh, in, for the, bo the bow fishing, uh, the BAA would like to say, first, you know, we don't feel uh, with a limited amount of allegations, uh, or alleged complaints, uh, and what we understand has only been a few small isolated areas, uh, warrants a change uh, or any additional regulations. Uh, that being said, if you do proceed uh, with these, we ask that you make some changes to what you have proposed here today. Uh, first off, when it comes to the generator situation, we ask when measuring the decibels that it only be done from one side on the back corner, four foot off the water. This goes hand in hand with some of the other regulations that you have with through haul motors. Uh, we suggest the starboard side, as most of us try to run counterclockwise, which would put the starboard side closest to shore and the side most office facing landowners. This also gives us more continuity than saying either side, which leaves too much room for variation. Next, when we're talking about headlights or other artificial lights, we feel this has no place in the spotlight regulation in regards to bow fishing. First off, no one else has this regulation for any other artificial light cast upon buildings or watercraft. This leaves way too many things for trouble. We absolutely have to take watercraft out as well. Just think if you're using a handheld flashlight to see markers in a channel and someone is fishing in that channel or next to that channel, now my light cast on that watercraft and now I have a violation with your new regulation. But if I'm rod and reel fishing, it's not a violation. Um, no one should have the regulation. It hinders us in navigating our waterways. And I can only go on and on with other examples from turning the corner of an island and there's someone there that you never saw to a fisherman wearing a headlamp, tying on a hook, picking his head up, um, and he shines his light across the water, and boom, another violation. But only if they're bow fishing, not if they're rod and reel fishing. I'm sure you get the point, you know, and your purpose here is to limit the large spotlights that are permanently fixed to boats for bow fishing from directly shining on residents and outbuildings. So why does it need to be any more than that? Uh, so lastly, I would like, on a little bit of a different subject, to talk about the northern snakehead. After reaching out to Sean Hartzell, uh, the invasive species coordinator, some time back, uh, I was very surprised at my email that I received. First off, um, why would we not be able to shoot an invasive species that we know has absolutely exploded in states like Maryland and Virginia? Uh, especially when 
uh, the state itself says, if you catch this fish, you're encouraged not to release it back in the water. Um, you know, when I got this email, uh, then he proceeded to imply by allowing bow fishing, it would promote the fish and the bow fishing community would ultimately spread this fish to more locations. Now, this is my interpretation, uh, which is hard to believe seeing the bow fishing community is absolutely the number one reason the snakehead in Maryland, Virginia have been kept to the numbers they are today. I would love to see us uh, come together and add this species to our waterways as well. I appreciate your time. I tried to keep it quick. Um, we've been making some great headway and uh, I don't think the, the things that we're asking for are, are too out of, out of line. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Nick. Next, we have Jordan Miller. Good afternoon. My name is Jordan Miller. I'm a licensed captain in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania with nocturnal addiction bow fishing. I've ran a charter in the Pittsburgh area for about six years. In those six years, we're doing about 200 trips a year. So 200 trips a year. I have a really good relationship with a lot of the law enforcement folks in the area. They all have my card. And to my knowledge, I have never been made aware of any complaints in regards to my generator or light. So since, since bow fishing has gained popularity, we have been featured on uh, Peterson Bow Hunting in the magazine, the Travel Channel. We've been featured on the Travel Channel, all bringing folks into our city of Pittsburgh for an urban environment bow fishing. That's kind of my business model there. So this year, I've done just around 200 trips. And in those 200 trips, about 20% are out-of-state residents. So just keep in mind, those are all fishing license sales. That's all revenue. I'm taking at groups of four to five every night out in the Pittsburgh area. Those folks are buying fishing license to bow fish in the city. The new proposals uh, illuminating light on buildings, uh, you know, that, that's kind of some of the areas I go in. There's structures. There's abandoned steel mills. My lights illuminate that. We're shooting fish around uh, old steel mills, and that's kind of draws people into Pittsburgh to, to explore the rivers. So, you know, this new proposal is definitely going to hinder my business. So I just wanted to bring that to note. I think it's worthwhile talking about the lights. So I, I, I understand there's some landowners that are complaining about lights and generators. I also live on the water. I live on the water in Pittsburgh on a houseboat, right on the end. I've seen people bow fish around. They're, you know, they go by pretty quick. It's not much disturbance to me. But also, you think about the barge traffic. I understand where these complaints have originated. They're, the alleged complaints originated. There's, there's not a lot of barge traffic. In my area, there are barges moving up and down the Monongahela, the Ohio River constantly. Those barges are equipped with high power spotlights that often illuminate my houseboat. They're also equipped with high power fog lights and floodlights on the side, which also illuminate my houseboat. So just keep that in mind. There's, there's other boats utilizing lights out there. I do not feel that it's appropriate for one area to have alleged complaints, and then we blanket the whole state with these regulations. If you think about, you know, complaints you've received, I'm sure everybody's received and there's documented complaints. If you go up steelhead fishing, it, elk and walnut, I'm sure there's landowners up there complaining about trash. I'm sure there's landowners complaining about folks in their water, but do we outlaw that across the whole state? No, because we're generating revenue. We're not hurting anybody. So just please keep that in mind with your proposal. You know, this is how I conduct my business and there are others in here and that's, this is how we make our living. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. Excellent. Next up, we have Jeremiah Weber. Hello everybody, my name is Jeremiah Weber. I own a boat fishing guide service in central Pennsylvania called Boondock Boat Fishing Adventures. I also make and manufacture boat fishing products and sell them all over the world. I'm here today to, you know, confront the, the original proposal and then I do believe that some talks have been had and it's been reduced. Uh, if the original proposal would have not been counteracted in any way by us, our legislators wouldn't have contacted you or anything like that, that would have diminished probably 90 to 95 percent of bow fishing in the state of Pennsylvania. My question is, what would your plan be if you took those bow fishers out of the equation? We take an awful lot of trash fish, we call them, or invasive species out of your waterways in the state of Pennsylvania. If if we were not doing that and paying you to do it with our license sales, our boat registrations, a lot of us own more than one boat. We have recreational boats, we have sporting boats and we have our bow fishing boats. If we, we took all those registrations out and our license sales out and we quit shooting fish for you guys, how would you counteract the carp and the flathead catfish, the invasive species that we take out for you for free and actually pay you to do it? 
Would you poison them like some other states have tried? Would you hire shock boats? Where would that money come from? How many would you need? These are all things that we need to look at. These gentlemen all went over the generators and spotlight. My generator is 64 decibels. I can have a conversation with you without this microphone while you're standing right beside my generator on my boat. I'm not sure where the noise complaints come from. Maybe someone's running a heavy construction generator on their boat and creating that. But that needs to be dealt with individually, and I do understand that. Um, if, if I owned a house alongside a highway and headlights were coming in my windows or I didn't like the, the sound of heavy trucks driving past, could I make a call to PennDOT and complain about that? And what would PennDOT tell me? They'd tell me to put my, up my own privacy wall and my own noise canceling fence on my own dime. Uh, I, I just don't see some of the complaints coming from homeowners. If we have a complaint with one of them, if one of them come out and pull a gun on us at a dock, we can't call the Fish Commission to interact with that person. We have to call local law enforcement. So I'm wondering why complaints from homeowners and property owners alongside the rivers or, or bodies of water Complaints are trying to basically take our livelihood away from us. We make our livelihood do it by doing this and plus our sport and recreation. There's thousands of people doing this across the state and helping you guys out by removing your invasive species. And I would also like to touch on what Nick ta touched on. Northern snakehead is going to be a horrible thing in this state within five years. It's already here. It's going to get only worse in the next five years. I anticipate seeing silver Asian carp making it into our Pennsylvania waterways in, in the next five years also. They're already in the Ohio River just shortly down below Pittsburgh. We're going to see it. Bow fishing or shock boating or poisoning or netting is the only way to control these species for us. We need to maybe start looking at improving bow fishing in the state of Pennsylvania instead of trying to restrict it in any way. Thank you, gentlemen and ladies, for your time. Thank you. Okay, next um, we have Greg McBride. Good morning, Commission. Everybody hear me all right there? A little, little bit louder, if you A little could. bit louder? Okay. Yeah, um, yeah I'm just a you know, concerned boat fisherman. I spent a lot of time up near uh, Pimatuming State Park on the far end, far corner of the state. Um, <clears throat> some of the things that I that I read under these regulations about, about the lights on the building and stuff. I broke this down, um, and basically, if a property owner owns a half acre lot, assuming that their lot is square, we're talking they have river frontage of 206, 210 feet. Our boats usually travel four mile an hour when we're underway with our lights on. Um, those, we are literally past that property in 30 to 40 seconds. Um, you know, when you look at it, it's like it's a small, minor inconvenience for certain people. I understand if I see a home, if I see people in a home, I don't go near it. I'll steer around it. Um, it's just, yeah, I think that, that we need to look at that as a big picture. We're talking about a sport that takes place a couple months out of the year. Okay, so how many times is, is a boat really traveling past these people's homes? I mean, is it is it once a night? Is it once a week for a period of two months, 40 seconds going by their house. I, I you know, I, I think that there's just some small interest groups that don't necessarily like what, what we do on that. So, and um, that's it, I'm done, thank you. Thank you. Hey, according to my list, that's, that's all we have for public comment, unless we miss someone or someone came in late. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Sure. Um, uh, yeah. I, I don't know where to begin. I started. Uh, How about beginning with, with just introducing yourself and uh, what you're here to do? My name's Eric Richard. Um, I guess for the first time in, I can say that uh, I represent Pennsylvania Wild Trout Network. Um, I spoke at four Trout Unlimited chapters on the value of movement specifically. Now, if any of you have been paying attention to the brook trout studies that were done on the Laurel Sock, if anybody been reading up on that at all, you can see where that direction is going. That's going to the movement, the value of it. Um, and the proposal to uh, change the amendment 
I can't remember the number of it for the extended season regulation. I wanted to say thank you to all the board members in here today that um, voted to approve that. Um, that is being seen as very forward thinking in terms of wild trout management. In my lifetime, Pennsylvania has gotten a bad rap in its management of wild trout around stocking. I don't think that's a secret. But this move to approve that amendment deserves recognition. You may not have heard anything about it because it was a truly a grassroots movement whose voice you heard and acted on, and that speaks to the Pennsylvania anglers in another way, that you're listening. And you all deserve a big for that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Anyone else like to give public comment? Okay. Let's move on. Thank you all for uh, coming. All right, um, commissioners, you were all sent uh, our board meeting minutes from our previous meeting in July. Any corrections, additions to the to the minutes? Comments? Hearing none, do I have? Yes, Richard. Oh, hearing none, I'll make a motion that the minutes be approved as distributed. And I would second that. Okay, motion is made and seconded to approve the, the minutes as sent to us. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Minutes are approved. Now I'm gonna turn it over to our executive director, Tim Schaefer. Great, thanks, Rick. Um, so first of all, I just wanna thank uh, the commissioners and staff for bearing with us uh, through yet another meeting. Um, um, under COVID uh, restrictions, thank you again for, for uh, abiding by the maximum requirements here inside the, the public building. Um, a lot of work goes into meetings like this, um, and I, I can just cannot thank the staff enough for the, the complexity of what we're dealing with you know, this afternoon, um, all the, uh, the different ramifications of potentially moving back to a single opening day of trout season. Um, the behind the scenes for the public to know as well, um, what we've done there with that vote uh, that's, that's pending this afternoon, not only um, will would consolidate it, uh, but also streamline our regulations going forward, such that if there ever be a need for a, a change like that again, it could be done much more simply. So we're doing a lot of housekeeping with this meeting, as as well as um, doing a lot of substantive work. Um, just also want to thank the staff for the continued integration that we see across the Commonwealth. Um, by all parts of the agency. And just last week, a video, if you haven't seen it, of, wor of work that we did at Woodcock Creek Lake in Northwestern PA, uh, feature, featured uh, fisheries biologist Brian Ensign, local waterways conservation officers, staff from the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, that video that, uh, frankly, it was an Army Corps video that we assisted on is, is emblematic of things that are happening every single day around the Commonwealth. So just thanks to everybody for, for that integration, integrated work. I, I, I literally am getting more excited about this job every day and the progress that we're making. So it's uh, it's happening and just thanks to the staff and the commissioners uh, for everything that you're doing. Wanted to highlight for the board three uh, significant meetings that happened, um, non-commission meeting uh, uh, events that happened since we had our last board meeting. Um, one was on October 6th, there was a joint informational meeting of the House Game and Fisheries and Tourism and Recreational Development Committees in the legislature. It was actually an in-person meeting at the Capitol. Uh, Commissioner Lewis was there to join us. We uh, were there with DCNR, with the Game Commission, uh, focused on addressing the spike in outdoor recreation in the last two years. And we're happy to say that it continues. Uh, we're still up over about 13% over in license sales where we were in 2019. Um, didn't have the huge spike that we did this year because other activities came online. But we're still up over 104,000 fishing licenses, um, 104,000 licensed anglers um, from where we were in 2019. Um, that hearing really highlighted how those numbers are consistent with what we're seeing at state park visitation, other sorts of outdoor recreation across the Commonwealth and the country. Uh, I get questions about launch permits. We're still up another 23% uh, in, in launch permits and boat registrations up about 10% over 2019. 
titling, it's really remarkable. We're up over 88% in the titling work that we're doing from 2020. Now, last year you had some reduced sales because of supply chain and places being closed, but that continues to be extremely, extremely robust. So um, that, that hearing, uh, it is available online through the House website, did a great job of capturing the growth of outdoor recreation in the last two years. Uh, thanks to everybody for fishing and boating, for doing it again in 2021. And a reminder, the licenses do go on sale December 1st, and then they will be the same price that they have been for about the last 15 years. Um, also want to thank on October 24th and for the whole discussion about invasive species, um, the Center for Rural Pennsylvania, uh, Chairman Gene Yaw. Uh, oh, I should have thanked the, the specific chairs, Chair, Chairs Gillespie, Nielsen, Millard, and Daly in the House for, for convening that, that tourism hearing. Um, but Senator Gene Yaw uh, convened a hearing from the Center for Rural Pennsylvania that our staff participated in reviewing the, the impacts of invasive species in Pennsylvania. It has really caught the attention of the legislature like I've never seen before. Uh, so thanks to Senator Yaw and the committee for convening that on October 24th. And then had a really exciting event in Pittsburgh on the 26th, the 20, 26th through 29th of September. Um, National Association of State Boating Law Administrators had their annual meeting in Pittsburgh. And I'm gonna read you, uh, uh, we had a real nice resolution uh, that I wanted the full board to hear and, and a, a piece from the letter says the attached resolution applauds the hard work, dedication, and professionalism of the staff of the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. Boating Law Administrator Laurel Anders in particular hosted one of the most successful events in the association's history, providing an exemplary program of speakers, seminars, and workshops to enhance the knowledge, development, and understanding of boating law administrators and boating safety professionals across the U.S. and North America. So, we're delighted to host that event, and we're really happy with how pleased they were um, and how, how we pulled it off. So thanks to, to Laurel and the rest of our team for, for the great work in conducting that national, national conference just a month ago. Uh, final couple pieces I want to report on. We've, we've heard uh, in this room about the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. This is the bill that's pending in Congress, H.R. 2373 and Senate Bill 2372 that would bring take the amount of funding we get for game non-game species in Pennsylvania which was split between the Fish and Boat Commission Game Commission from about one and a half million dollars to over 20 million dollars a year and allow for just monumental progress on non-game species conservation. We're up to 10 co-sponsors from Pennsylvania in the House. Senator Casey's a, a sponsor. It's expected to get a hearing in early December and we're extremely optimistic about its passage. So just thanks to all the commissioners um, and our legislators who sponsored that bill. Final two things are, are boating related. I uh, want to remind folks that our boating facilities grants are open uh, again for proposals until December 30th. Um, these are grants that are available for, for the planning, acquisition, development, expansion, and rehabilita rehabilitation of public boating facilities in the Commonwealth. Uh, for those listening from uh, the Delaware River watershed, we have an additional $400,000 available thanks to a grant from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that's administered by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation as part of their Delaware Basin Conservation Act. So um, excited about that. If anyone would like our staff to come for a site visit, I know Commissioner Gibney has been on them in his district, Commissioner Charlesworth, last grant round, we are happy to come out and uh, help communities figure out how to connect better to their waters. Um, last thing, and, and, I, and I mean it when I say this, and I mean it every time I say it, I don't care if you remember one thing that was said this entire day, other than wear your light jacket. Uh, we had the ninth uh, uh, boating fatality uh, in Pennsylvania over the weekend. Uh, reminder, come November 1st, all boats under 16 feet in length, including all canoes and kayaks and paddle boards, you must be wearing a light jacket. Cold water kills, the, uh, the, the data absolutely backs that up. 80% of the fatalities every year are not wearing their life jackets. Most of the accidents happen in the summer, but disproportionately we see those fatalities happening in the cold weather months, uh, which is why you uh, and, and your predecessors uh, passed that regulation a number of years ago. So please uh, remember to wear your life jacket uh, during the cold weather months and all year long. So with that concludes my report. Thank you, Tim. And uh, on behalf of the Board of Commissioners, I'd like to thank you as well for your energy, keeping us informed, 
even the six o'clock in the morning text, you know, that wake us up, but we'll, Turn your volume. but we really, really do appreciate all, all the things that uh, you're, you're keeping track of and working with us and staff. And uh, uh, thank you. Yep, thanks. Richard, comment? Yeah, I want to say that uh, this is Commissioner Lewis, I, I, I'm particularly interested in the legislative work that we do and have maintained an interest in that over the past four years. And um, I attended the hearing that Tim talked about and the difference between that hearing, I attended another one also earlier this year, which was our annual report hearing to the House Game and Fisheries Committee. And the difference between the attitude and the, the welcome we got from the legislature over the past three or four years is dramatic. It's incredibly dramatic. And I want to go on record as publicly saying to Tim and to Mike and to Julie, our legislative folks, I really appreciate how hard you've worked over the last two or three years to improve and solidify our relationship with the legislators. We now get welcomed when we go there instead of shunned. And uh, I, I just want to publicly thank Tim and, and, Mike, and Mike and Julie for the work you've done and say how pleased I am with it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Richard. Okay, next, uh, I'd just like to um, let the public know to announce that we had uh, an executive session prior to the meeting this morning where we discussed personnel, legal, and real estate matters. Now, I'll turn it back over to Tim. Um, had some information on some notational votes. Yeah, but these, this is also informational. It's in your packet in Appendix A. Uh, the commission conducted two items by notational vote um, since the July 2021 meeting. Uh, between August 10th and August 13th, uh, there was a 10 to nothing vote, uh, which was an approval of an item dealing um, uh, with, with personnel. And between August 23rd and the 27th, a nine to nothing vote with one extension, exempt, uh, abstention uh, dealing with a grant. So two, two notational votes both found in your patent. Okay. All right. We're going to move on to committee reports. And our first committee report this morning will be the voting committee. Um, turn it over to Commissioner Charlesworth, who was was the chairman of that committee. Uh, Charlie, I, I just wanted to say that I was unable to get the information from the last meeting. Okay. And, uh, Commissioner Lewis is going to make the report for me. Okay. Thank you, Charlie. Um, as Charlie mentioned, he wasn't able to be with us at the committee meeting, so I, I chaired the meeting. In his absence, um, and we had a lively, actually it wasn't a meeting, it was a briefing. It was not a meeting, it was a briefing. And uh, we had a lively briefing and it went very well. Um, we received the Bureau of Voting staffing update. We now have a Bureau of Voting with staff, something we didn't have a year or two ago, which is really speaks highly to our commitment to the voting community as well as our anglers. Um, the commission owns some marinas and we got updates on the status of those marinas. Um, we also got an update on the Lake Erie Boating Access and Facility Study Program. And we also received an update on the statewide public access grants program. And as Tim mentioned, I remind all, everybody that is interested in uh, trying to obtain a grant to improve or establish a boating facility access um, that, that those those grant applications are due by December 31st. And that's, again, something that we've just really picked up again in the last two years. And we've been awarding, I think it's safe to say, hundreds of thousands of dollars, is that correct, to communities to have them establish or improve boating access uh, in their communities. Uh, the, the grants have to be requested by government agencies, but often they partner with individual organizations. Um, we also heard about the outcomes from the National Association of State Voting Law Administrators Annual Conference in Pittsburgh. Tim mentioned that to you briefly. Uh, one of my, I was privileged to attend that conference along with my colleague, Rocco Ally. And uh, one of the takeaways that I had from the conference was that uh, voting law administrators would like us to move away from the word accident when we're describing voting fatalities and other uh, serious, significant um, incidents and, and use the word incident because the implication with accident is that it was something to happen as an act of God. And 
either all or almost all of every uh, boating fatality or other incident isn't an act of God. It's, it's something that is preventable, and therefore we should be using the word incident, not the word accident. Um, we went over the rulemaking items that are going to come up in this agenda today on boating. We received a boat registration, titling, and launch permit transaction report, which Tim reported on. Uh, we got a legislative uh, update on Senate Bill 403 and House Bill 1153, which would align the boating registration term with our calendar year. This is something that we have again been responsive to boaters on. Uh, the, the, the license fee runs out, registration fee runs out on the 31st of a year, but the decal has a big year number on it. And a lot of times boaters would not see the small type or not understand that their registration runs out on March 31st and would continue to boat and then receive a citation because it wasn't clear to them. So we've changed that now so that the, the titling, excuse me, the registration um, period will be annually. Um, if, I, if I might, Richard, uh, the legislature needs to act on that. So we have recommendation the bill is making its way through the legislature. Has right, to change right. That. Yeah, yeah. and I, evidently it is moving ahead. I saw on the legislative report the other day that it, it, they passed the Senate or something like that. Or the bill has passed the Senate and is set to receive a vote in committee on November 9th. From the uh, House Game and Fishery House, Committee. Okay, yep. good. So we're close on that one. Uh, we received some updates on voting safety uh, education certificate update and a water rescue program. And then finally, we discussed uh, doing a better job on voting safety communications efforts. And uh, our director of, of, of boating, Laura Landers, said that she would like the opportunity over the next couple of months to come back to us with a plan that would help us do a better job of communicating boating safety. We have nine fatalities right now this year, which is still too many. Part of this package might be something that I've suggested called a boating safety alert, which would describe an incident that happens, an actual case history, how it happened and what, what suggestions are for prevention in the future, but done in a generic way so that you would never be able to identify who was involved in it. Um, lastly, the boating committee is going to work hard now to work together with the boating advisory board and have a commitment from staff that we're going to try and combine those two meetings as much as possible in the future so that uh, we don't have duplication and we know that the boating advisory board and the boating committee are sharing ideas. And Mr. Chairman, that completes, uh, Mr. President, that completes the boating committee report. Thank you, Richard. Any questions, comments? Very complete and uh, thank you. Okay, moving on, uh, turn to Commissioner Pastore for Fisheries and Hatcheries Committee. Uh, thank, <clears throat> thank you. The Fisheries and Hatcheries Committee convened one meeting since the July commission meeting. That meeting was held on September 15th and was held virtually. There were three discussion items on the agenda for the meeting and First was an overview of the fisheries agenda items planned for today's meeting. The second was stream sections stocked with trout by the commission or a cooperative nursery that were proposed for class A designation at today's meeting. And the third topic was Lake Erie lake trout management. These were purely discussion oriented items and no votes were taken. For the first item, Staff provided an overview of the fisheries agenda items planned for today's meeting. Those agenda items consist of five items up for final rulemaking and seven proposed designations. This was not intended to take the place of or replicate the full presentation that you will see and hear during our full commission meeting today. Staff simply introduced each voting item and provided a brief overview and status update as to where they are in the regulatory process. The second item of business was stream sections stocked with trout by the commission or a cooperative nursery that are proposed for class A designation at today's meeting. If approved at today's meeting, the proposal would add seven streams to the list of class A wild trout streams. Three of those streams are stocked by the commission, two of which are also stocked by a cooperative nursery. Additionally, three of these streams are stocked by a cooperative nursery and not by the commission. 
and one stream is not stocked by either the commission or a cooperative nursery. Staff provided an overview of the class A program specifics regarding each stream. Implications for future stocking. Potential streams that trout could be re redirected to if these streams are designated as class A. And strategies staff implement to optimize stock trout angling near newly designated class A wild trout streams. The final topic of discussion was lake Erie lake trout management. Mission biologist Chuck Murray gave a detailed presentation regarding ongoing Lake Erie lake trout management rehabilitation efforts with a rationale for the staff's proposal to reduce the daily creel limit of lake trout from two to one. That concludes my report on the September 15th Fisheries and Hatcheries Committee. Thank you, Dan. Next up, uh, Commissioner Anderson, Habitat and Environmental Committee report. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the Habitat and Environmental Committee met virtually on Wednesday, September 22nd uh, from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. The meeting was called to order by myself, uh, Chairman Anderson. All four committee members were present. We had no agenda items to discuss. We did have four presentations by our staff. Uh, they were as follows. Uh, ben Lorson gave us a presentation on road salt and the salinization of our freshwater ecosystems. Uh, Sean Hartzell gave us a presentation of aquatic invasive species update. Nevin Welt, uh, his presentation was on muscle silo research project. And Scott Ray, uh, the foreman are at our Union City fish hatchery, uh, gave us a uh, Union City hatchery mussel propagation update. I would like to commend our staff for the fine work that they are doing in these areas. And I have been to the Union City fish hatchery uh, twice to see the muscle culture program there. And I would encourage any of my fellow commissioners who have not been there to make the trip to see it. Uh, I think it's a very worthwhile program and uh, I commend our staff for all the fine, fine work they're doing. I'd also like to say that a recording of the September 22nd meeting can be viewed on the commission's YouTube page. So that concludes my report, Mr. President. Thank you, Don, and that's a good reminder for everyone, too, that uh, the uh, committees are on there. Okay, moving on to Commissioner Ally, Law Enforcement Committee. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Law Enforcement um, Committee met earlier um, in October in a virtual public meeting setting. Um, one of the discussion items that we spent an awful lot of time on was um, receiving increasing number of complaints regarding bow fishing. We also heard public comment relevant to that subject this morning. Um, most of these complaints revol revolve around the intense bright lighting used to locate fish along the shoreline. In addition to the lighting, the noise created by the generators used to produce the lighting. Um, I'd like to, at this point, compliment uh, Colonel Warner and his staff. Uh, during this meeting, we went back and forth quite a bit, but we did come up with a proposed rulemaking, which Colonel Warner will enlighten us on later on in the meeting. Um, so far, I think we have a proposed rulemaking that uh, I think everybody can live with, but. We'll see with that whenever it goes out for additional public comment. Thank you. That completes my report. Thank you, Rock. Uh, before we jump into uh, the next item on the agenda, we're going to back up a little bit and go back to the executive director's report. Yeah, so Rick, Rick and I are a good team because I reminded him about the Pledge of Allegiance and he reminded me about my piece. I wanted to introduce uh, Rob Brown. Rob is our new deputy uh, for field operations. Uh, Rob meant to introduce you during my report, so, but welcome. Uh, Rob comes to us from our, our northern hatcheries. Uh, he's been overseeing them for, for a number of years. Um, real excited to have Rob in this role. He's based out of Northwestern Pennsylvania. 
but will be joining us at our center region office here in a couple of weeks. So, Rob, welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Tim. And again, welcome to Rob. All right, moving on to uh, public access and real estate matters. Um, Brian, are you going to? No, Linda's going to take care of that. Okay. I'm just Linda, handing things off, so she'll take care of it. Okay. Linda Adler, take it away. Good morning, commissioners. This morning, our first item is the Glade Run Lake in Middlesex Township, but Butler County. Uh, the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission owns a 146 tra acre tract of land in Middlesex Township, Butler County, containing a 53 acre lake known as Glade Run Lake. Glade Run Lake is approximately 23 miles due north of Pittsburgh and is depicted on Exhibit A. The Glade Run Lake Conservancy and the Allegheny Land Trust have formed a partnership to identify properties of recreational and environmental importance in the Glade Run Lake watershed with the goal of securing, securing property rights to allow for the public use, protection and preservation of these properties and Glade Run Lake. The Conservancy and the Trust have identified a 53 acre property currently owned by the Jones Estates Group LLC as a potential acquisition. The property is located adjacent to and at the head of the Commission's Glade Run Lake property. It is bounded on the northwest by Sandy Hill Road and Glade Run flows east-west for 1,400 feet through the property and is depicted on Exhibit B. The trust has entered into an agreement of sale with the Jones Estates Group to purchase the property for 344500 The agreement expires on December 31st, 2021, but may be extended to March 31st, 2022. The sale is contingent upon the approval by the trust board of directors and the trust may terminate the agreement within five days after all due diligence is completed if the property is found to be unacceptable to the trust. The trust has submitted a Community Conservation Partnership Program, C2P2, grant application to the Pennsylvania Department of Con Conservation and Natural Resources and is in investigating other funding sources to allow for the acquisition of the property. The C2P2 grant funds are awarded to successful applicants in November 2021. Upon acquisition of the property, the trust would like to donate the property to the commission. The commission's acceptance of the donation would be contingent on meeting due diligence and funding requirements, including but not limited to the trust providing good and marketable title to the property, free and clear of all liens and judgments, and an acceptable environmental assessment. Staff recommend that the commission authorize the acquisition of the 53 acre property in Middlesex Township, Butler County, as more particularly described in the commentary. Do I have a motion to accept the staff recommendation? Second? Second. Okay. The the uh, recommendations been uh, moved uh, approved and seconded. Any comments, questions? Hearing none, we'll call. Yes. If I can comment, comment on this acquisition of this property will further protect that lake that we just put a new dam in because it's the primary water source of the lake and to protect it from residential development is crucial. I compliment not only the commission, but the Glade Run Conservancy for putting this forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, no further comments. Do I have a vote to approve the recommendation? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, next we move on. Go ahead, Linda. The next item is the Nesmic Lake property, Borough of Wells, Borough and Township of Delmar in Tioga County. 
The Pennsylvania Fish and Com Boat Commission owns a 223 acre tract of land in the borough of Wellsboro and the township of Del Mar, Tioga County, which contains Nesmuk Lake, a 60 acre lake. Property is located one mile south of Wellsboro, Pennsylvania on Route 287, as depicted on Exhibit C. In 1967, the commission leased the property to the Borough of Wellsboro and Wellsboro Borough Municipal Authority for a 40-year term for use as a county park. The 40-year lease was amended and provided for a new term of 25 years in 1997. The amendment also included the placement of a life flight helicopter landing pad on the premises. The lease area and the landing pad are depicted on Exhibit D. The lease agreement between the Commission and the Borough and the Municipal Authority expires March 3, 2022. The Commission and the Borough and the Municipal Authority wish to enter into a new lease agreement consistent with the original lease. The Borough and the Municipal Authority are, are and will continue to be responsible for the routine maintenance operation repair and supervision of the lease area. The continuation of the boroughs and municipal authorities leasing of the property is in the best interest of the commission. The new lease will be for a 25 year term and require the site to remain open for public fishing and boating free of charge. Fishing and boating will take precedence over all other recreational activities and responsibilities will remain consistent with historical practice under a new lease. Staff recommend that the commission authorize the leasing of Nesmuk Lake to the Borough of Wellsboro and the Wellsboro Borough Municipal Authority as more particularly described in the commentary. Okay, you've heard the commentary. Do we have a motion to approve the staff recommendation? Okay, Commissioner Anderson, second. Commissioner Hussar, any questions, comments? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Happy to move it. Thank you, Linda. Okay, we're now going to move on to our next item. Uh, we're going to have Brian Wisner. Give us an update uh, on the Cooperative Nursery Grant Program. Good morning, Commissioners. This morning, I'm bringing uh, to you a proposal to improve the Cooperative Nursery Grant Program. Uh, this grant program started back in 1996. I think Commissioner Anderson was part of the, the starting process, or at least around then. And, uh, its main purpose is to provide financial assistance for projects at the nursery, things like aerators, nursery covers, nets, and it's not used for feed or utilities. Now this funding limit has fluctuated from the original 15,000 to a high of 80,000 annually, and the current limit is set at 60,000. The nursery, uh, cooperative nursery unit receives 20 to 40 grant applications each year, and typically, seven or eight applications are denied due to the funding limits. So what we're proposing today is to remove the annual funding limit for the program. This will allow flexibility based on available funds and go up to $25,000 grant per cooperative nursery. This will allow nurseries to better maintain their equipment and also meet infrastructure needs that are out there. And once these applications come in, they're scored by the staff and prioritized. So staff recommend that the commission remove the annual funding limit for the cooperative nursery grant program and authorize the executive director to establish an annual funding limit for the grant program that is based on the projected need of the program in conjunction with the annual budgeting process used to address all other agency priorities. Staff also recommend that the commission authorize the executive director to approve individual grants of $25,000 or less per cooperative nursery per year. For grants in excess of 25,000, staff will seek separate commission approval. Okay, thank you, Brian. 
having heard and read the commentary, do I have a motion to accept the recommendation? Okay, Commissioner Anderson. Second, uh, Commissioner Ally. Comments, questions? No, just like there's no caps on, oh, there's no board imposed budgetary caps on any other categories. We would budget for this just like we do any other category, whether it's vehicles or staffing or anything else. Uh, just gives us the, the the us the opportunity to to manage the budget for this program like we do every other part of the agency. Okay, any further comments? Been properly moved and seconded. All those in favor of the staff recommendation, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, opposed. Motion carried. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Brian. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Tim. Uh, it's going to announce the dates for our future commission meetings for the next year. And then after that, we're gonna take a five minute break. Yep, so uh, you can see the dates on the screen. We're required to have two meetings per year, one in January, other in July. Um, those need to be in the Harrisburg area. We traditionally hold two additional meetings um, each year. And you can see the dates that are proposed for the calendar year 2022. Okay, Brian, to the next slide. The staff recommend that the commission approve the dates published in your materials and on the screen for 2022 as set forth in the commentary. Okay. So moved. Commissioner Small, moved to accept the recommendation. Do I have a second? Commissioner Brock, any comments? Yes. I'd step out for a minute. And I, uh, I, I do you're calling comments now, right? The on, on the dates of the, where we moved on to the dates for the oh, uh, upcoming meetings. I and we withdraw my request. Okay. All right. Hearing no other comments. Do I hear a, mo a motion? Excuse me. Do I please signify by saying aye if you approve the staff recommendation? Aye. aye. Anyone? Object. Hearing no objections, motions carried, and those are, will be our dates for the coming year. Okay, let's it's let's come back. Let's convene at uh, five minutes after eleven. Okay, thank you, everybody. Let's uh, begin with Laurel Anders and some uh, voting final rulemaking. Laurel. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Laurel Anders. I'm the director of voting. This morning, we have an amendment for your consideration to 58 PA code section 111.6 for Berks County, specifically Blue Marsh Lake. Currently, the regulations uh, for this lake um, restrict towing activity. Boats may not tow more than one water skier or um, one person. Some of the devices that are very popular and being towed are designed to carry more than one person. And these devices meet the legal definition of a water ski. The US Army Corps of Engineers contacted the Fish and Boat Commission and requested uh, that we amend the regulation in order to limit the number of devices rather than the number of persons being towed behind boats at Blue Marsh Lake. The current regulation does not serve the intended purpose of when it was initially developed, causes confusion among boaters, and is unnecessarily limiting. This amendment to the water ski regulations again would limit the number of devices to one rather than the number of people being towed behind a boat. In fall of 2019, the Army Corps requested the change that you uh, requested the change. In June of 2020, the Boating Advisory Board discussed and recommended um, an amendment to the Commission. At that time, the Commission approved proposed rulemaking. However, we later discovered there was an error in the wording of that rulemaking, so no further progress was made on the amendment. Earlier this year, the Army Corps contacted the Commission and requested um, that we revise the wording accurately um, to the amendment you see on the screen. 
in June of 2021, so just this past June, we re-presented this amendment to the Boating Advisory Board for discussion, and they recommended it to the commission. The commission approved it as proposed rulemaking at the July 2021 meeting, and it was published in the Pennsylvania Bulletin. We received 10 public comments regarding the proposal. Eight comments were in favor, two were not related to the proposal. So now what you see on uh, your agendas in front of you today is the final rulemaking item for vote. Staff recommend that the commission adopt the amendment as set forth in the notice of proposed rulemaking. If adopted, this amendment will go into effect January 1, 2022. Okay, thank you. And uh, I'd like to make that motion to accept the staff recommendation on, on this rulemaking. Is there a second? Charlie, is there any comments? I, I'm going to make one because it's in my home county and uh, and I attended a meeting with the Army Corps. I've been out several times with our conservation officers and, and this is going to help them a great deal. And I, you know, I appreciate the, the boating advisory board and uh, Laurel for their efforts on this one. No further comments. I'd like to call for a vote. All those in favor of the recommendation signify by saying aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Okay, next. The next item for your consideration is an amendment to 58 PA Code 111.43 for Mercer County, specifically Shenango River Lake. Currently, boats on Chenango River Lake are restricted from using motors in excess of 10 horsepower in the area west of the railroad causeway to the Ohio line. And that is the area that is um, in the red and blue diagonal in the northwestern portion of the lake. The Army Corps of Engineers has changed their local policy or regulation and adopted a 20 horsepower limitation west of the causeway. And they've requested that Fish and Boat Commission amend Title 58 so that WCOs can continue to assist with enforcement of this rule change. This amendment was appro approved as proposed rulemaking at the July 2020 Commission meeting. And of course, this was after the Boating Advisory Board had discussed it and recommended it to the Commission. Um, however, it was never published in the Pennsylvania Bulletin. So earlier this year, um, I contacted the project manager at the um, Shenango River Lake and asked if they were still interested in this regulation and asked if it was still relevant. They indicated it was, so we went ahead and published a notice of proposed rulemaking in the Pennsylvania Bulletin. We received no public comment regarding this proposal. So for your consideration today is a recommendation that the commission adopt the amendment as set forth in the notice of proposed, proposed rulemaking. If adopted, the amendment will go into effect January 1st, 2022. Right. Well, Hearing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Is that positive, Richard? Yeah, it was aye. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. We're going to move on from proposed rulemaking, or excuse me, from rulemaking to proposed rulemaking in the Law Enforcement Committee and Colonel Warner. You've got the mic. Thank you. Good morning. So law enforcement has the uh, following proposed rulemaking, which will be amendments to 58 PA code 63.8, longbows, crossbows, spears, and gigs. Um, a couple items we're going to discuss would be the lighting use for bow fishing, uh, the noise restrictions, uh, and bow fishing in special regulation waters, finishing up with uh, the new proposed uh, regulation. Bureau of Law Enforcement has received feedback from many groups on 63.8 from Commission staff, property owners, 
anglers, fishing guides, and legislators, and all agree changes are needed to reduce the growing number of conflicts occurring on Commonwealth waters. On the screen currently, there's some different examples of the equipment that is currently utilized in bow fishing. Uh, the top two slides there, you see the, the lighting uh, that is generally utilized, um, some of the ar arrow tips and the way it's tethered to the bow. A couple different examples of the uh, style of bows that are being utilized once again with, with the tips as well as the way they're uh, tethered. Bowfish lighting, um, bowfishing anglers use extremely intense lighting to locate fish. Uh, pro the number one complaint that the Bureau of Law Enforcement staff received regarding bowfishing is the shining of these lights upon structures close to the waterway and at all hours of the night. Staff proposed to add a section making it unlawful to cast rays of a spotlight, headlight, or other artificial light from a watercraft upon any building, occupied or unoccupied, or another watercraft. This langu language closely mirrors the game of wildlife code with regards to recreational spotlighting wildlife. Bull fishing anglers on occasion use generators to operate the light and used on watercraft to locate fish. Once again, the Bureau of Law Enforcement receives many complaints regarding loud generators being used at all hours of the night by bow fishermen. Staff proposes to add a section making it unlawful to use generators on board watercraft engaged in bow fishing that exceed a noise level of 90 decibels, exceeds the noise, noise limit of 90 decibels. Bow fishing in special regulation trout waters. Uh, this would just clarify that bow fishing spears and gigs are not authorized devices to use in all special regulation trout waters. This change would help reduce any potential conflict between anglers who are bow fishing using spears or gigs in special regulation trout waters. Staff proposes to add a section making it unlawful to allow bow fishing or the use of spears and gigs in all special regulation trout waters. 63.8 currently, as you see on the screen, A, B, and C would remain the same. The proposed amendment, section D, number one, it would be unlawful to use bow and arrow, including compound bows, crossbows, spears and gigs, and any special regulation trout waters. Number two, it would, it, it would be unlawful to cast the rays of a spotlight, mounted headlight, or any other artificial light of any kind from a watercraft upon buildings, whether occupied, unoccupied, or another watercraft. And number three, it would be unlawful to use generators on board a watercraft engaged in bow fishing with a noise level that exceeds 90 decimals. In summary, the pro proposed amendments to 63.8 would prevent both user conflict and issues with property owners and would help simplify current regulations. Thank you, Colonel. Yeah, one more. The staff is recommended, and again, this is for proposed rulemaking, not a final rulemaking today, as presented a recommendation to the commission. Do I have a motion to accept the recommendation for proposed rulemaking? Okay, Commissioner Ally, seconded by Commissioner Anderson. Do we have discussion on the recommendation? Commissioner Lewis? He popped his hand up. Yeah, first. after listening to the comments we had this morning, I would ask um, the Colonel whether or not we should be adding um, snakeheads to that list of species. Does anybody have an opinion on that? Well, that initially was part of the package. Um, I'll defer to fisheries. Chris? The snakehead issue? Do you want to address the snakehead issue, why that's not part of the package? So that was that was something that was part of the original package that we uh, reviewed as staff and credence and looking at some of the other statements certainly provide that to snake heads. Uh, however, we had to start with uh, targets by essentially non target species and bringing it's all of those activities. And so one of the things that uh, one of the species is often confused with same heads in both. So that that's a species that's, that's just recently in 2016 came off our, our friend that is injured this. 
We also have in start of the disk AIS, etc. So the top four opinion, I guess, it, it must be clearly defined in the regulation that that's the problem to be considered as AIS is. So those were the concerns that we, we, we brought to the law enforcement consideration that aspect of what we have all right, one other question too, um, if I might. But um, based upon the uh, input we had from the witnesses this morning, they said that it would be very difficult to always be careful and not spotlight buildings or unoccupied or unoccupied or other watercraft. Is that something that's going to be an enforcement? In other words, if minimal, if accidentally they do something like that. Shine to see where they're going. Okay. We're going to make a recommendation on that. Okay. Okay. They, we're going to make a recommendation on yeah. that. I, I, that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. President. Okay. I, I just have a question, if if I may, on, on back to snakeheads. So, without specifically putting it in here, we can already they can already harvest them. Correct. No. No, cur currently what, what, what's on the, on the list for species that are allowable for bow fishing, and, 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 and Colonel Warner can correct me if I'm wrong, are carp, suckers, and catfish. Those are the only three species groups that are able to be targeted with bow fishing gear. All right, just wanted to clarify that. Okay, Rocco. Mr. President, if I may, if we look at the uh, second exception, Maybe we should go back to that for uh, um, Where it has artificial light of any kind, any watercraft, comma, if we inserted the word directly upon, instead of saying upon, say directly, does that make it a little better for Commissioner Lewis's comment relative to finding, um, you know, I can see where a boat would come in with a spotlight to find dock, which I can understand that. So by using the word directly, would that help us out any? I, I would have no issues with that. Any other problem on that? Or, Still subject. Yeah. So I'll just get that. Yes, I, 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 the first one that we talked about this ruling, um, I was in favor of it, but giving it more thought. Um, if you lived on a turn, on a highway, every car that goes by shines in your your living room window. What's the difference between that and shiny spotlights when you're fishing? Uh, I'll show how old I am now. Uh, when I was a kid growing up, the alcohol facility uh, was guarded by guard towers all the way around the facility, right after the Korean War. And, uh, you know, there's just nothing you can do about it. When, they, when they're checking their territory with that giant, the spotlight this big around, I was, like I said, about 30, 30 yards away from the tower, and right by bedroom window. You just get used to it. Uh, so, my thought is, can you break those down into two separate issues? One, the lighting, and one, the generator. Uh, my answer would be, I guess that's that's uh, would have to be turned back to the committee, and maybe you, you know we have to have them go back to the committee, um, take a look at some of these things, the other options. 
Uh, again, though, just a reminder, this is proposed rulemaking. There will be a public comment period and we'll have time prior to the next meeting to to approve this and to make some changes to it. Yes, Eric. I was, um, <clears throat> Um, get over the email, so where I mean, was this a regional? I mean, it's a statewide. It, it pretty much is. I mean, uh, the, you know, I would, you know, and you know, I've been in in this position just since February, but it sounds like it's been an issue primarily in the south central part of the state, south central, southeast regions. Um, I did check with all the regional captains, and they all indicated that they had some type of issue recently, whether it was lighting, generators, um, to, to some effect, but the, the hotbed of activity is South Central, the Susquehanna River, uh, and the Southeast region. Mr. Chair, Mr. President, Mr. Chair Anderson. I, I seconded the motion today, but I also wanted to say I appreciated the uh, bow fishermen that came in today here and and gave us comment, and I definitely think too that we need to review this here. I, I wanted to see it go out for proposed rulemaking. Maybe we can get some more comments, but I do think we need to revisit it. And uh, we could table the motion. Fine tune it a bit, I guess I should say. We could table the motion too. Any? I, I, I liked your suggestion, which was let's pass it, but it's got to go through another co public comment period, and we still get to amend it again. In January, when it comes back to us, that's what I like. I mean, I'd rather not stall it completely because I think it's a need we have. But uh, as long as we have the opportunity to continue to amend the language another time, I'm, I'm, I would vote in favor of it. Okay, thank you, Richard. If if we would not be ready in January to vote on it for final rulemaking, we could table it then too. But yeah, correct. I think that's we need correct. to have some more discussion on it. Okay. Commissioner, uh, if you get to uh, pass this proposed commission, then most likely we're going to call the site and we're going to get back to you for the final consideration. Okay. Uh, and then if we made an amendment, it may be prolonged. We amend that proposed rule. The, the amendments you're proposing, for example, if, if you're talking about adding intentionally or directly, they don't require you to go back. They can just be made as part of the final rulemaking. Or we could just drop it and make up a new. So it sounds like this, yeah, the timetable will be the same if we drop it. If it's not going to get there until April, we could have something new from the committee in January, finalize it April. It would really be the same. Correct. Right. You know, my my point is, if you want to make the kind of amendments you're discussing, you would not have to redo the proposed rulemaking to do that as part of the final. I think we do have proposed rulemakings out there. Still far out there on the issues. Commissioner Pastori. I had a couple of comments. So, so with respect to the second issue, I do wonder why why wouldn't that be applicable to essentially anyone out on the water? Why why is it particular to people using doing this type of fishing. Wouldn't we want that if we were going to restrict people out on the water shining lights on the shore, wouldn't we want that kind of across the board? Why would it be only applicable to this type of fishing? I mean, based on the feedback that we received from the, the various groups that we talked about early on, um, based on complaints, based on uh, officer feedback, uh, it's specific to this activity. But wouldn't it be the same problem, whether whatever, what I, whatever I was doing out on the water, even if I'm not even fishing, if I'm out in the water, spotlighting a, a home, don't be 
what do we want? If we want to prohibit it here, we want to prohibit it there also. We haven't had complaints that that act that is actually taking place. Like I said, it's specific. And just one other comment. We had sure. several um, meetings ago, we had put some regulations in on noise level, I believe on this around the Pittsburgh area for um, muffler regulations. Mm -hmm. I just wondered how the decibel level compared to that. Well, that's exactly, it mimics that. That's where we got that from to try to keep consistency. Thank you. Okay, I. I guess I really can't explain <laughs> that, but um, it, it's. Okay. A chainsaw is more than ninety. Chainsaw wow. noise is higher than ninety. Wayne, did you have a, a final comment? Why this is specific to um, bow fishing, and if, if we go back a slide, can we go back a slide? See in uh, section A, uh, towards the middle, it says we specifically allow uh, bow fishing to be aided by light at night. So since we're saying you can use light at night, we're saying well now it's, here's the exception. Um, for what it's worth. I'd like, to, I'd like to recommend that we table this motion, throw it back to the law enforcement committee to discuss and, and, and make some amendments, changes, and then we bring it back to the January meeting. Comments on that? Uh, I know Commissioner Lewis. The only uh, term I've seen, I would, I, I would not to get public, public. Okay, understood. If I may, I, I think um, to Rick's suggestion, we could still get that public comment, but perhaps to refine the language even between now and January, certainly put that out for public comment then. Um, we would also accept if, if we did a law enforcement committee meeting reminder, that would be a public meeting also. So if, if you have been waiting, stop it, it's anything wrong, but if it's been table. And if the committee were charged to look into this further, we would certainly accept any and all comment, you know, leading up to, and then at that committee meeting, and then the committee could come back with, again, some, some refinements to this and have that formal proposal put out for public comment. Yeah, and you really don't talk about any of them. And you can talk about enforceability on sheets. I don't know how many more options you have to check in for a little 16 feet. And then those are 16 feet to shoot. Uh, <laughs> um, and we have that in our portal. I don't know. That's what our regulation is on. Mr. President, uh, although I prefer passage of this now, I'll yield to your suggestion. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Lewis. Unless otherwise, we'll follow through with tabling it, turn it back to the law enforcement committee and uh, try to um, get dates for that as quickly as possible so that we can receive some public comment. Thank you. I'll make that motion. Okay, Commissioner Brock made the motion, seconded by Commissioner Hussar. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign. Okay, motion carried to table that motion. Thank you. And just by the way, thank you, Colonel, and thanks to everybody for thinking this through. And thanks to folks to, to come here and make us rethink this because that's that's our goal is to to make sure that we're we're doing what's right for everybody. And then just to make clear, so the intent is the desire for there to be a law enforcement committee between now and January. Correct. Okay. All right. Um, 
We're going to break for lunch. Let's reconvene at 1230. Lunch should be here. Uh, and we're going to be in the room across the hall. So uh, we're going to break for lunch. Reconvene at 1230. All right, Chris Kuhn, take it away. Good afternoon, commissioners, uh, members of the public that are joining us here in person and those that are listening in. I'm Chris Kuhn. I'm the director of the Bureau of Fisheries, and I'm going to be taking us through the next four voting items. The first of which is what you see here before you, and that is to establish a single statewide opening day of the regular season for trout under the various chapters you see listed 61, 63, 65, 67, and 69. And so this is certainly not a new topic uh, to the commissioners or the public. Uh, we had a, a detailed presentation provided by retired uh, uh, Deputy Director Andy Shields in the, in the end of June at a fisheries hatcheries joint law enforcement committee meeting. I also presented this presentation in July as proposed rulemaking. I'm going to be going through it here again in, as for the final rulemaking step in the regulatory process. But I'm going to try and streamline it a little bit. There's the content still remains in the, in the slides, uh, but I think we covered a lot of the details in July. So certainly there'll be opportunity to ask questions at the end of the presentation. And so just to be, just to begin with, to give a little bit of history, uh, right now what we have in 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 section 611 that is Commonwealth Inland Waters regulations, the regular season of trout is is defined from 8 a.m. on the first Saturday after April 11th to midnight on Labor Day. This is a long-standing and well-recognized tradition. It's much anticipated. Uh, a lot of folks look forward to this and plan activities and angling outings around the opening day of trout. In 2007, uh, under section 6512, a regional opening day of trout was created. And this was done primarily uh, because of differences in temperature and stocking suitability uh, for South Central and, and Southeastern, the 18 county area that's currently in the regional opening day. And so in 2020 and 2021, we went to a single opening day, not, not for the purposes of why we're here discussing it today, obviously, but uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, there was, there was uh, concern over traditional stocking practices and opening day crowds uh, with transmission of the virus. We wanted to reduce that situation. Uh, we also wanted to reduce cross boundary travel between opening day zones. And so that's one of the things that we would hear from, from landowners that uh, had property near the, the regional uh, and traditional opening day boundary is where those border waters, there was a lot of overcrowding that occurred with people moving back and forth uh, to take advantage of the two opening day scenarios. And additionally, travel restrictions that were put in place required more anglers to fish closer to home. And uh, this provided us, us a situation then to further consider the need for a regional opening day. And so a little history on, on the process. And, and so we had staff discussion of potential trout season state changes uh, beginning uh, actually early this year and late last year. And uh, we formed an ad hoc committee that were uh, made up of, of various a diversity of folks throughout our agency and multiple bureaus to discuss this issue. The primary things that we focused on in, in that committee uh, were the three questions you see before you here on this slide. Basically, should we eliminate the opening day of trout altogether? Should we maintain two opening days or return to a single opening day of trout? Or, and, well, and, and if we were to go to a single opening day, uh, what would that date be? What would that look like? I'm not going to go through uh, the, the, the scenarios. You saw the proposal in July, all the scenarios here. I'm going to focus in on the return to a single opening day here for the purposes of this presentation. And so some of the pros for returning to a single statewide opening day include it simplifies things. There's certainly less confusion and less landowner issues at border water, waters, which I briefly touched on before. Uh, 
we have a lot of new anglers that are, that are coming into the sport of fishing uh, over the last couple of years where the complexity of two opening days can be somewhat confusing. It also gives single opening day, uh, gives, gives statewide anglers an extra uh, week, week of fishing if the date were chosen, cho or chosen to be earlier than what it is now. A single opening day also allows uh, to, to better prepare for a sales surge. One of the things that uh, certainly businesses and tackle shops and, and, and those that uh, accommodate traveling anglers into their region, uh, they can better plan for that uh, if, if, if we have a single opening day. Also, the public has already experienced this um, in 2020 and 2021. So it's an easy transition. It's not a change from what we've, what we've experienced recently. And finally, I'll just mention that uh, our, our hunt fish PA has proven that, it, that, that, that that system can certainly handle the sales volume associated with a single opening day. Some of the cons that were identified is there's more weather related. Good go back. I think it was the uh, the, the production benefits um, for the earlier stocking. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry, Tim. I, I I glassed over that. So there's certainly one of the other things that's a pro for uh, going to a single opening day at an earlier date than what we have now is we have uh, benefits to production cycle. So uh, what we if if we get the fish out of out and stocked into the streams earlier, it allows our hatchery personnel to spend more time conducting doing other activities and prepare the fish for the next stocking year so that they're in, in the best possible condition and the largest size uh, that we can we can get them to in the hatchery system. And some of the cons that I started into, uh, there's more weather related travel issues potentially during stocking periods in that the northern tier water bodies um, may be frozen during the earlier part of the stocking period. Certainly there's the potential for that when we shift to an opening day that's earlier than what we experience now. Um, we, we also could have displeasure from anglers who take advantage of, of, of the two opening days now and look forward to traveling to, uh, to between the two regions to take advantage of those opening days. Um, we would also need to, to close streams to fishing earlier than March 1st. So right now it's on the books is what we have the closure period from March 1st until the opening day of trout. This is to allow sufficient time for our hatchery personnel to stock the streams in advance of opening day. If we were to shift to an earlier opening day statewide, we would need to move that back slightly to accommodate that. And also looking to optimize uh, or, or minimize rather the, the closure period, uh, not to, to, to take away from angling opportunities. And so in terms of timing, uh, we looked at four different scenarios here. Um, we looked at the regional opening day currently, which is the first Saturday after after March 28th, we also looked at the sec second Saturday in April, and we looked at uh, what it is currently, which is the first Saturday after April 11th, and considered the, the pros and cons of each of those. And where where we the consensus was is, is that it made sense for the first Saturday in April. This minimizes conflict with Easter weekend. We looked at the calendar moving forward 20 years in advance from now, and only three out of the, 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 the next 20 years conflicts with Easter weekend as a common complaint that we receive when it falls on an Easter weekend. And it also allows for simplification for anglers to, to remember when opening day in Pennsylvania occurs. Certainly the first Saturday in April is easier to remember than the first Saturday after April 11th. <clears throat> And so, in addition to uh, staff discussions, we wanted to hear from the anglers. And so, one of the things that was done uh, this this year in 2021, Division of Fisheries Management staff routinely go out and conduct opening day angler use assessments on our stock trout waters to get an index of angler use and determine which waters are popular. This year, we took it a step further and took the opportunity to poll anglers about their opinions regarding a potential change to opening day. Basically, whether they preferred um, the current approach with the two opening days, or they would like to see a single opening day. And 201 out of 311 anglers hold supported a single opening day. Additionally, the, the consensus from WCOs 
who ought to hear from anglers is for a WCO. Those are, yeah, for, for a single opening day, the WCOs are, are, are continually interacting with our anglers in the field and receive a lot of feedback. And what they were hearing is that there was, there, there was a desire for a single opening day. In addition to the, 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 in the field surveys that uh, our biologists conducted on the opening day of trout, we, we all, our, our outreach education and marketing folks pulled together an, an email survey of licensed buyers and specifically those that hold trout permits. And so uh, we looked at a, a unique customers that purchased a trout permit from 2018 to June of this year, 2021, and took a random sample of annual and multi-year license holders. And so uh, I point out that multi-year license holders only make up a little under 7% of all the, 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 the license holders. And email invitations then were sent uh, July 1st with at least one reminder after to this random sample. And the goal was to generate at least 4,000 responses from each of the two groups, uh, annual and multi-year. And we quickly got to that point. There was a really uh, quick return positive response from those that received the emails. And you'll see with the multi-year licenses uh, buyers, uh, we, we had a little over 4,000 responses and annual license just, just over 5,000. So we got a really good sample of, of the, those that received the email survey. And so just to go through a little bit of the, the results here, uh, we have uh, the first the first question was the opening day of trout is important to me. So this helps to frame the responses and, and gives us an idea of who who were who were uh, actually getting feedback from. And you'll see that the vast majority of, of those folks either strongly agreed with that or somewhat agreed. So the, the, the those that responded to our survey. Uh, viewed the opening day of trout season to be important. And then when pulled on preference for the opening day options, uh, we, we, we gave them the, the option of, of one statewide opening day or the current status quo, the regional and the statewide opening. And you'll see that the, the vast majority, again, two thirds uh, supported one statewide opening day for the regular season of trout. And finally, just in terms of a, uh, the, the, the date pre preference, this is, this is somewhat mixed results, but the majority uh, were favored the uh, first Saturday in April, followed by the second Saturday in April, and then some had no preference. And so I just wanted to provide a little summary here. And, and, and considering all the information presented, staff support a change to a single statewide opening day for the regular season of trout on the first Saturday in April for the reasons that I, I previously described and those that are outlined here. Certainly it simplifies regulations and reduces the potential for angler confusion associated with the current format. It reduces landowner issues in the border counties. It also provides statewide anglers at least an extra week of fishing opportunity given that the, 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 the proposal if, if approved as, as proposed would be Early, an earlier opener on the first Saturday of April than what we currently have. It also better allows business to plan for a single um, sales surge associated with the opening day of trout. And so I have the, the extended season closure period right now. That is the period that I described before where uh, we close stock trout waters to angling to allow for our hatchery personnel to stock the fish is March 1st we would need to move that back a little bit. And we're proposing to have that on the third Monday in February. So all streams and lakes that are not currently in our stock trout waters open to year round program would be closed to angling the third Monday in February until the opening day of trout to allow for stocking purposes. I mentioned that all lakes are not going to be open to catch and release fishing during the closure period. You'll recall that this year, that was that was uh, something that was provided and it was part of our temporary change to fishing regulations and will we'll, um, uh, no longer be in effect after those go, uh, go off the books in, in January. So 
we're gonna we're gonna have the um, the the lakes that are stocked with trout be closed as they were in the past, with the exception of those that are in the stock trout waters open to year round program. We have roughly 47, I believe, lakes in that program out of approximately 128 lakes uh, that are, that are stocked. And so th this change is, is, is essentially going to be enacted in section 61.1, and you'll see the, 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 the regulation chart here coming up um, will be where it is defined as the first Saturday in April. Um, but this change also has a ripple effect through the regulate other regulations where uh, stock trout, uh, the, the, the opening of the stock trout season is referenced, where we're going to amend various sections that reference the start of the trout season. Additionally, I'll note that salmon is being eliminated from any language associated with the trout salmon permit. Okay, so here's the here's the regulation table that I mentioned. This is PA code uh, section 611 or Commonwealth Inland Waters regulations. You'll see that the, the, the first Saturday after April 11th is being removed and it's being substituted as the first Saturday in April. Again, in the extended season, you'll see that the 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 last day in February is being changed to the third Monday in February to provide for an early closure period given the trout season is being moved up. And so I'm not going to go through all the regulation tables. They were provided in the agenda, but I provide one here as an example. That is uh, Delaware River, West Branch, Delaware River and and River Estuary section 61.2. And this is an example of where we generalize the language in other uh, regulations that are affected by this. So rather than state the first Saturday in April, we're, we're amending or proposing to amend these to the opening day of the regular season for trout. And this provides us with the flexibility then in the future that if there's ever a desired change that needs to be made to the opening day of trout, we wouldn't have to go through the same process of amending all the regulations that are tied in. We could, we could simply amend 61.1, which you saw before in the previous slide. And so here's the list of all the different sections that would be affected uh, by the change. Not going to read through those. Didn't include 61.1 and 61.2 because they were included on the previous slide. But you'll see there's quite a few different regulations that are being affected by the change to the opening day of trial. And so a notice of proposed rulemaking was published in the Pennsylvania Bulletin on September 4th. That's Exhibit H. In your in your packet, and the commission received a total of 24 public comments regarding the proposal. 16 comments support the proposal. One comment opposes the proposal, and seven comments do not pertain to the proposal. So staff recommended the commission adopt the amendments as described in the commentary. If adopted, the amendments will go into effect January 1st of 2022. Okay, thank you, Chris. When you see, we see the recommendation from the staff to adopt single opening day. Um, do we have a motion to accept staff recommendation? Commissioner Brock, we we'll make that motion. We need a second. Yeah, Commissioner Hussar. I think I heard you first. My left ear better. So, any questions, comments? Yeah, I just, and I know we heard this in July meeting, Chris, talk me back about the lake, that portion again, because that was an issue. Yeah, certainly, Commissioner Hussar. Fishing, like Whipple, was that a catch and release lake, Whipple? No, so, so in, in this year in 2021, as part of the temporary change, we allowed anglers uh, the opportunity to, to, to catch and release fish at all stock trout water lakes. And the reason this was done is because we, we shifted the closure period to, uh, it, was, it was February 15th this year. And so to mitigate the loss of angling opportunities with a shorter uh, or a longer closure period rather, uh, we offered anglers the ability to 
fish for catch and release at all stock trout water lakes. This is being, this is part of the temporary change that as I mentioned, will basically sunset at the end of the year and that will revert back to what it previously was. So we have a program specific to stock trout waters open to year round fishing, which we're gonna hear a little bit more about from Dave Nyhart later when he, he, he proposed, provides a proposal to add some waters to that. Right now we have approximately 128, I wanna say lakes in our stock trout water uh, program. 47 of those are in the open year round program. So those lakes are only the only ones that will be open to catch and release fishing. And I will say, and as I said, Dave will go into this a little more, that our open to year round program is geared towards fisheries with characteristics that we have a good angler following for warm water, cool water species. We also have robust populations of warm, cool water species. It's not intended to provide additional angling opportunities for stock trout. However, it's an artifact of opening it up to warm water, cool water anglers during that period that folks can also fish for stock trout on a catch and release basis. So it'll essentially revert back to the way it was prior to the temporary change in 2021. Uh, that's, I need that walk through again, thanks. Any further comment? And then as we look at other regulations going forward, we will be using, this goes through the new opening date line like we've been using on this. Yeah, so what I, I mentioned that in my opening remarks, there's a, a you know, Chris said all the different places that we're, we're making, tightening the language up. And um, if there ever would be a desire again in the future to change the opening day of trout season, it would be much easier logistically to do that. Having no further comments, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, like sign. Motion carried. Okay, Chris. All right, so Don't up next, carry. we have amendments to 58 PA codes 6912, that is season sizes and krill limits for Lake Erie, Lake Erie tributaries, and Presque Isle Bay, including the peninsula waters. That's in Erie County. And so as we were going through um, uh, this, there, there, it was identified an opp opportunity to simplify regulations while also improving upon trout manage management and optimizing fisheries for that species group. So as it stands currently, the, 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 there's a couple of aspects to this too. I'll step back and say there's a couple of aspects to this as to why it wasn't covered in the uh, single opening day piece. It has a much broader scope in that there's a regulatory simplification component, which is what's detailed here on this slide, but there's all, also a fisheries optimization component that I'll talk about here a, a little bit moving forward. But in terms of the simplification, currently Lake Erie regulations prohibit fishing and possession of trout from 1201 on the Friday before the first Saturday after April 11th until 8 a.m. on the first Saturday at, after April 11th. So um, the, the proposed amendments to 61.1 pertaining to the opening day of the regular season for trout would result in a single opening day on the first Saturday in April. So what we're proposing is, uh, as part of this piece is a modification similar to like what was affected in the uh, other regulations uh, that we just talked about on the single opening day is, is to modify uh, a modification to Lake Erie Basin trout regulations to better align with the change that would allow anglers to more easily identify when fishing and harvest are permitted. Right now, they don't currently uh, match up directly. We have uh, the ability for anglers to fish up until the 32 hour closure period prior to the opening day. This would simply be shifting this back to align with the opening day being on the first Saturday of trout. And so additionally, uh, we identified an opportunity to enhance trout angling and promote the trophy component of the fishery. Currently, daily krill limits during the regular season for trout are five trout, only two of which may be lake trout, uh, at nine inches. And when I say the regular season for trout, I'm referring to the period from the opening day of trout season uh, to Labor Day. 
And so obviously this is a is extremely popular fishery in, in Erie, hundreds of thousands of angler trips for steelhead are generated and millions of dollars annually. And so the thought or intent with this part of the proposal is that a lower krill limit and increased size limit would further protect against over harvest while also enhancing the trophy component of the fishery. The other piece of this proposal is that lake trout are an important component of the Lake Erie ecosystem and recreational fisheries. Uh, as I described previously in July, the commission cooperatively manages lake trout through the Lake Erie committee uh, with other member jurisdictions. So we have a cooperative management of, of this species and other Lake Erie species with Ohio, Michigan, Ontario, New York, and then Pennsylvania being the fifth uh, jurisdiction. And emphasis on, on this species is placed on recreation or on restoration. And we also have a recreational component to this. Uh, however, staff have proposed to reduce daily krill limit from two to one fish with the, with the idea that it could improve rehabilitation efforts. And also as, as a side note, not the intent of this regulations, it would also align with New York's regulations. So they, they also have a one fish limit in New York. Not that that was the impetus for this, but it would be an added benefit for regulatory alignment. And so at the, at the fisheries hatcheries committee meeting uh, that, that, that the commissioner Pastore presented results on earlier, one of the things that was uh, discussed was the, 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 the management of lake trout in, in Lake Erie by Chuck Murray gave a detailed presentation just wanted to provide a brief overview of some of the things that he had provided there to set the context for, for why staff were recommending uh, the, the, the reduction in the krill limit of lake trout. As I previously mentioned, uh, they are managed as a recreational fishery, but there's, a, there's certainly a trophy component to that. Um, it's also recognized as a rehabilitation species. It's been the efforts of rehabilitation in, in Lake Erie for some time now. Um, and recently, older and bigger fish are, are being found in the population. Our, our biologists in the Lake Erie Research Unit routinely conduct surveys, and, and we're seeing um, more bigger fish in, in some of the results there. And these are fish that are favored by anglers, and they're also prime spawners. Uh, as Chuck mentioned during the Fisheries Hatcheries Committee, uh, lake trout were extirpated for various reasons in Lake Erie, and they've been the focus of rehabilitation efforts uh, by multiple jurisdictions with the intent of, of producing a, a, a reproducing population, reintroducing a reproducing population. So reducing the creole would provide conservation to spawning stocks and provide angler opportunity. Um, and anglers can still harvest the fish of a lifetime. There's still the ability to, to harvest a, a very large lake, lake trout there. And we just recently had the state record uh, broken in, in 2019 with a 31 pound, 13 ounce fish, which is a really nice fish. Catch and more release mortality is not as much of an issue with lake trout as it is with some other species in that they don't suffer bear trauma. They have the ability to, when brought up from the depth, uh, release the gas in their swim bladders. We additionally have a do not eat in, in, in advisory on lake trout that are over 30 inches. So these are some of the considerations that TAC staff took into account when formulating this proposal. And so in summary, aligning the lake trout salmon seasons uh, with the proposed change to 61.1 would provide regulatory consistency and simplicity with the overall change to single opening day. Additionally, modifying the creel and size limits for rainbow trout and lake trout could better optimize those fisheries. And it should be noted that a reduction from five to th three fish daily krill limit and an increase in minimal size from nine to 15 inches during the regular season for trout would not impact the krill and size limit for brown trout. That's a popular put and take fishery uh, during the, the spring season in, in Erie County. A popular put and take fishery. Um, so, additionally, uh, a, redu a reduced daily krill limit of lake trout from two to one and an increase in the minimum size from nine inches to 15 inches would provide further protection to the population, with a, which is consistent with ongoing 
multi-jurisdictional rehabilitation efforts in Lake Erie. And so this is just a, a, a look at some of the language that's being proposed to be modified. I'm not going to read through all this. This is certainly in your uh, agendas, and this is the piece uh, that's the regulatory alignment aspect where we would be changing to with the general language uh, of the opening day of the regular season for trout rather than the first Saturday after April 11th. And here's the regulation table that's being proposed. So I have this on two slides just because it, it got to be too busy and too small a print if I included it on one slide. Uh, but we, we're shifting to, the proposal is to shift to more of a species management approach uh, where we group brook and brown trout together. The, the brook trout uh, are not stocked by the Fish and Boat Commission in, in Erie County. However, there's always the opportunity for, or the chance that an angler may encounter one when fishing there from other sources. So we wanted to have that regulated. And so that's basically um, removing the piece on the daily limit column of uh, only two of which may be lake trout, uh, because lake trout will be covered in, in, a, in another portion of the table, um, but then changing the, 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 the seasons for those. So essentially it would remain as it is for brown trout, where you have minimum size of, of nine inches and five fish during the regular season, where it, which then shift back to um, three, spe three brown trout of 15 inches. And then managing rainbow trout and, and salmon separately, uh, basically having what, what this does is, is to, to, to make the krill limit three fish with a minimum size of 15 inches, essentially year round with the exception of the 32 hour closure period prior to opening day. And then the lake trout piece where it's pulled out uh, with the increase in the minimum size, again, year round, uh, basically, except for the 32 hour closure period with the one fish daily limit. And it's, it should be noted that um, as a qualifier, we put some asterisks into this table and you'll see the, 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 the bottom, the text on the bottom of the slide clarifies it. The intent of this is obviously not for these to be additive. Uh, the daily limit for all species of trout would remain at five during the regular season and three during the extended season. And so a notice of proposed rulemaking was published on September 4th, that's exhibit J. The commission received a total of 39 comments regarding the proposal. And because this proposal had multiple pieces, I broke the comments out into a little more detail than, than what we normally do, but three comments support the entire proposal. One comment supports the portion of the proposal pertaining to rainbow trout. One supports the portion of the proposal pertaining to lake trout. Six comments oppose the entire proposal. One opposes the portion of the proposal pertaining to rainbow trout. 14 oppose the portion of the proposal pertaining to lake trout and 13 comments did not pertain to the proposal. As such, staff recommended the commission adopt the amendments as described in the commentary. If adopted, the amendments will go into effect January 1 of 2022. Okay, thank you, Chris. We've all had an opportunity to see the recommendations here. Um, do we have a motion to accept the recommendation from the staff? So I'd like to make a motion to accept the staff recommendation with one modification, and that is to restore the daily limit for lake trout to two. So specifically in the table that's on page 30 of today's agenda, on the last row that relates to lake trout, change the daily limit from one is in the agenda back to two where it was, where it is this year. Cool. Okay, a motion was made to accept the recommendation with with an with an amendment that was proposed to change the creel limit for lake trout only from what was proposed to one to two daily. Correct? Correct. Okay. Seconded by Commissioner Ally. You know, it was my understanding that doing this at 
the cost should be temporary until we have more data collected and we can evaluate it. I mean, the feeling was that we're, the, the process is in place, but there still may not be enough data available to verify the justification. So it very well could come up by next year, the year after, and it comes back down to one. Is that correct? Yes. So at the July meeting, staff proposed changes to the Lake Trout size and creel limits, including reducing the creel limit from two fish to one. But the proposal was accepted as proposed rulemaking in July. At the September 15th Fisheries and Hatcheries Committee meeting, we heard a presentation from Chuck Murray on the motivation for proposing the reduction in the creel limit. After the July meeting, the proposal was put out for public comment as Mr. Kuhn just related, the changes to the creel limit for lake trout generated considerable public input. Most of the comments centered around the concern that the reduced creel limit would have on the sport fishery in general and the charter fishing business in particular for lake trout. Mr. Murray and I also met with representatives of two fishing organizations to hear their concerns about the changes in the creel limit. This was after the July meeting. The goal of restoring a naturally reproducing population of lake trout on Lake Erie is clearly laudable and something that I fully support. What we know at this point is that there is no statistically significant evidence of natural reproduction of lake trout in our waters. We also know that we do not have solid evidence on the number of lake trout actually being caught or harvested or the characteristics of those of that type of fishing. We don't know how many fish are caught and then released, how many are caught and kept, and the mortality rate of the released fish. Although they do have the ability to be brought up without dying, they do have a tendency to, to bleed a lot. And if they're deep hooked, many of those fish do not survive. The recent telemetry studies um, that Mr. Murray went over in the fisheries and hat uh, meeting um, provides important new evidence on the spawning habitat and the spawning habits of these fish and where they appear to be spawning. This coming spring, the commission will deploy dry traps to gain additional evidence around lake trout reproduction on the Pennsylvania waters of Lake Erie. Other jurisdictions are also continuing to gather evidence to better assess the status of the lake trout populations. As a result of our meetings, members of the angling community, including members of the Lake Erie Charter Captains Association, the Erie PA Sport Fishing Association, have agreed to conduct surveys this fall and next spring to document the number of trips and anglers targeting lake trout, the number of fish caught, the number of fish harvested, and the characteristics of those fish. This will provide additional evidence to evaluate the fishery. For these reasons today, I support leaving the creel limit for lake trout at two. However, I request that at the July 2022 commission meeting, staff report back on the new evidence gathered and update the commissioners on that evidence around the natural reproduction of lake trout. I'd also encourage staff to consider an educational campaign to promote better understanding of our lake trout. We want anglers to treat lake trout as the trophies that they are, and to better understand their life cycle, we can effectuate change by educating the public about this native fish. Thanks, Dan. Uh, go ahead, Eric. So, Dan, they press. They don't do they reproduce stuff. Until until recently, we, we have not documented natural reproduction in Pennsylvania waters. Just recently, New York captured a a young of year or, or, or a young year lake trout that documented uh, reproduction. But so far, reproduction has been been unsuccessful in Lake Erie. We're working towards that and um, with with increases in larger uh, fish, there's the potential for benefit to 
uh, reproductive success. And as Commissioner Pastore said, we're going to further investigate that in Pennsylvania waters. The the the, the information that that Chuck provided uh, uh, Chuck Murray in in the Fisheries Hatcheries Committee showed um, some maps of identified spawning areas. We're going to uh, deploy fry traps in the spring of 2022 that will help inform us as to whether there's actual reproduction taking place and if those those eggs are hatching out into fry. Uh, and we're also going to gather more information from from uh, charter boat captains in a cooperative effort in some of the things that Commissioner Pastore stated uh, by getting information on something that we, we have a lot of information on through the Lake Erie Boat Angler Survey. But one of the things that we miss with that oftentimes is the charter boats, as well as the time of the year that lake trout fishery is 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 in full swing, which is in the fall and the spring. So I I, I I'm I'm looking forward to collecting some additional data and being able to present that uh, to the commission uh, in July of next year. That sounds like a process. It is, and it's it. Research. And it. Waterboats. What your snapshot cannot show the trend based on. No, certainly not. It's it's gonna. That you can years determine some. Value. Yeah, that's exactly right, Commissioner Hassar. It's it's it, it, we're gonna we're gonna gain some more information to to understand what's what's occurring in Pennsylvania waters. However, this has been an ongoing effort for the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission as well as the Lake Erie Committee for some time. And there's there's a lake trout rehabilitation uh, plan actually that is in place and has been recently reviewed and revised by the Lake Erie Committee. I'm not sure if it's been finalized yet, but it's very close to being finalized. It will not only help guide Pennsylvania, but other member jurisdictions in their management of lake trout moving forward in Lake Erie. Just, just one more question, Greg. Why would you, why did New York do this? Did they decide that one of three of them in New York? Yeah, that's correct. They have they have a one fish krill limit. It's 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 tough to align jurisdictions. Um, a, a lot of different the jurisdictions around the lake have varying regulatory regulations that differ from Pennsylvania. It's, it's not just it's not New York's different in the size, but they're similar to what's being proposed with the one fish. Ohio has more uh, a, a large a higher uh, bag limit for for lake trout, so it varies by jurisdiction. And New York's regulation has been in place for for some time now. Okay. It was in Lake Erie. It was in the New York waters of Lake Erie. Because are all the stock trout they are. The adipose fin is removed and they're fitted with a coated wire tag. So there's an ability to determine whether a fish is, is is of stock or wild origin. And that's been going on for some time now. And it, uh, recently, just this year, there was there was a larger fish that was captured in Pennsylvania surveys that was not tagged. So it's assumed to be a wild fish. The other way we can get at that is to look at the chemistry of the inner ear stone or the otolith. Uh, we have not received the results of that. But we have we have sent that out to a lab for an analysis. Basically, the, the the chemical signature of the water where that fish was was grew up as as a young fish, where it was spawned, um, and where it resides as an adult. You can if there's if there's changes uh, differences in that, you can detect whether it's of wild or stock origin that way. And we're looking forward to seeing those results here uh, this winter sometime. So my, my understanding is the, the one that was caught in New York was caught in a fry trap and New York has given us or loaned us fry traps. So we've never used those previously to 
to trout, lake trout. The telemetry studies that they just concluded give a very much clearer picture of where the fish are. And as I think Chuck Murray would say, we don't know that they're spawning, but everything suggests that they probably are the way they're congregating on the reefs. So putting, I think we're on the cusp of getting much better data. We've got the fry traps, we know where they are. We know what New York did. We're gonna put the fry traps out this year, get that information back and should have much more solid data whether we're able to find any fish that appear to have been naturally produced. Let me just add also that there was some discussion also about potential slot limit um, with these, at least amongst the, the group that I met with, with Chuck, that that could be another approach to this. One, you could take a trophy fish, um, maybe have a two fish slot limit, only one of which can be over a certain size. So that's another possibility that really just needed more analysis. And so gathering more information about the size and potential age of the fish that are being caught would make that, give us information on whether that would make sense, the doctor regulation. And if I may, um, I think by us using fry traps and getting objective data to support the fact that there could be young of the year, I think that only gets us to go. Commissioner Brock's statement of, hey, if we've got this information, let's tell people about it and tell them why we may restrict or put a slot limit on it. And I think that will go over much better with our angle. Thank you. Just one more question. Uh, how many fish do we put in the lake, Chris, a year? You know, I'm not sure offhand. I, I don't know. I don't have that number for you right now, Commissioner Hassar. They are. They are. It, it, fish and wildlife stocks all the fish. So it varies. But that'd be, uh, we could get that data. And, and and that was that was part of Chuck's presentation. I just can't recall offhand. There was a lot of numbers in there, and there was some discussion about the different strains. So not only Pennsylvania, um, obviously Fish and Wildlife Service for all the jurisdictions is experimenting with different strains of, 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 of lake trout to determine which ones most might have, have the best likelihood for success. But I can certainly get you that information. Okay, we have a motion on the table to accept the recommendation with the amendment that the Commissioner Pastore made to change the creel limit for lake trout back to two fish um, instead of one. It's been, it, no, it's been properly, it's been properly moved and seconded. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, same sign, motion carried. And I'd like to just personally thank Commissioner Pastore for all his efforts along with Chuck Murray, Chris, and the entire committee because um, I, I was in, involved in these meetings too and a lot of thought went in and again, because of public input, um, we're, we're trying to do what's not only best for the resource, but also for our anglers. And I think this is a great opportunity for future uh, uh, development of, of lake trout and uh, the research possibilities there. I think it's great. So uh, thanks to all, particularly Dan, for um, leading this effort. Appreciate it. All right, moving on. Establishing trout slot limit programs. Chris, again. All right, so next up we have the establishment of the trout slot limit programs, that is all tackle trout slot limit and artificial lures trout slot limit, and that would be under 58 PA code chapter 65. And so this is certainly a, 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 an item that has been discussed at, at length uh, with, the, with the commission in this year on various formats, not gonna go into all the detail here, um, but I will point out that it, it is part of our, our strategic plan for the management of trout fisheries in Pennsylvania. Uh, our current issue of that or update of that, and that's under issue 16, uh, where it identifies that there may be an, uh, uh, an opportunity to provide anglers with increased uh, opportunity to harvest uh, intermediate sized fish 
while improving the size structure of the wild trout populations by protecting larger trout from harvest on some productive streams. Information gained through the pilot slot limit regulation at Penns Creek Section 3 uh, supports establishment of a formal trout slot limit. And what that would look like, this is just a, a, a generic type of regulation table that was pulled together. Uh, basically, the slot limit proposal is uh, a bag limit of, of two fish per day uh, at seven inches, equal to seven inches, but less than 12 inches would be permitted during the regular season for trout for the opening day through Labor Day. And there would be no harvest the remainder of the year, uh, no harvest on individuals over 12 inches or under seven inches. And so this, the trout slot limit would have two sub programs that would be all tackle, which would allow for uh, the use of bait and all tackle types and then artificial lures only, which would limit to artificial lures and flies being the terminal tackle. These sub programs would basically uh, provide the, the, the ability to select the best tackle option to achieve both biological and social objectives for specific waters. Commission staff. Have, have identified waters that could be included into this program. Uh, however, at this time, it would be premature to discuss which waters those are. What we would do moving forward if this regulation were to be to, to pass and we would have this as a tool in our toolbox, we would look to uh, contact landowners on potential waters to determine their, their uh, favor or opposition for such a change on waters flowing through their property. That's one of the things that we routinely do. And as part of practice uh, when designating anything in special regulations is we certainly seek to have majority, uh, basically 85% of landowners in support of any regulation change because we wouldn't want to apply a regulation only to have a landowner post property because they're in opposition to that. And so this is in your uh, agenda. Uh, it's not bolded or underlined as it, as it is in there as, as procedure for posting in the bulletin. Um, however, this, this, this is uh, the language that we're proposing for the all tackle trout slot limit. And then we have the language is also in your agenda uh, for the artificial lures only trout slot limit sub program. A notice of proposed rulemaking was published on uh, September 4th of this year, and that's Exhibit L. And the commission received a total of five public comments regarding the proposal. Three support the proposal and two do not pertain to the proposal. Staff recommend that the commission adopt the new regulations as described in the commentary. If adopted, the new regulations will go into effect upon publication of a second notice in the Pennsylvania Bulletin. Hey, thank you, Chris. Do I have a motion to accept the staff recommendation on establishing a trout slot limit program or programs? So moved. Okay, Commissioner Lewis made the motion, seconded by Commissioner Small. Comments, questions? I have a question. Um, Chris, under what circumstances would you, so you're looking at Penn Street. How long has that been set up in Slack? It's, it's, it was a miscellaneous special regulation that was put into effect in 2014. So what, what criteria would you need to see to lift the slot? And, and, and would you see it after that becoming a no-kill or, or back to harm? To, to, to remove the slot limit? I mean, I, and so there, it, the first question is, is it a temporary? Is it, is it a, a streaming well, enhancement regulation? Yeah, right now, like with Penns Creek Section 3, it, it, it's evolved over the course of, of, of a lot of landowner discussions, public meetings, and, and, and data analysis. So with Penns Creek Section 3, um, early on in the process of that, what the things that staff was prepared to pr propose catch and release regulations for Penns Creek Section 3. However, at public meetings, as part of the public comment process, what we heard from the public is they were not in favor of that and they wanted the ability to be able to harvest trout. And so staff uh, researched slot limits and determined that this was, this was a good way to not only protect large fish in the populations, 
but allow anglers the ability to harvest intermediate sized fish. And that's a tool that's in uh, fisheries managers toolbox uh, when it comes to certain populations with certain characteristics. For example, a population that is, is, has, a, has an abundant abundance of, of intermediate sized fish, if we can get anglers to harvest those fish or some fish out of that intermediate slot, it frees up resources and provides for potential growth um, um, increases in, in individuals remaining in the population. So that was one of the things with Penn's Creek from the biological standpoint, as well as, as the social standpoint. We, we've been conducting annual surveys of, of the, 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 the trout population in Pence Creek Section 3, and what we've seen is a substantial increase in the, the number of large fish, that is those fish over 16 inches in length. Uh, as another step in the, in, the, in the regulatory evaluation process, we, we conducted an angler use and harvest survey on Pence Creek Section 3 in, two, in 2019. And what we found there is that the vast majority of the anglers that were interviewed supported this regulation. They liked the idea of having the ability to harvest fish. However, most of them were not harvesting fish. And so we would continually, you know, as part of the process, and it seems like on Penn's Creek, and, it, and that happens with a lot of our higher profile streams, uh, there's more intense monitoring that goes on as part of the, the fisheries management process. Staff routinely reevaluate management of, of those waters. And if for some reason in the future, uh, some characteristics that would be identified, but whether it be uh, public interest or uh, a support for a change and or population level changes that would dictate a proposed change, we would look to refine. Them. So I don't look at any of these regulations as being permanent. Um, they're, they're, they're a part of adaptive management. Yeah. I just don't know Pennsylvania this this twenty twelve hours I still uh, and, you know, I'm sure we're going to buy this for a while, trout water, and I'm killing it for a while. <laughs> Got to wear it on this. So, um, a lot of trout infections, but, you know. So, um, I know where they use it. I saw it. I mentioned on Ray Gary. I mean, I, they use it for species. It works. Uh, Section 3, um, it absolutely works. Um, I know that I wish it would like. I just said before, and I still say it again, I wish it would have more on this section. But, uh, um, uh, so, you know, you know, just going forward with it. I know you like to ask the floor of the toolbox, it's the same risk, but I could just speak for us to be great and straight right now. I'm on our wild trout streams, and uh, um, I would assume that's what it's going to be used for. Yes, this is this is this is a, a, a would be applied to solely to wild trout streams. So it has no no, no utility for stock trout yeah, waters. I guess I want to get to the section for that. And, uh, however, it did work. It was a trophy trout before. We have very low fish over 40 inches, all the water fish were more than six inches. Did the study for seven years, which is about the age of a trout. And then now we have abundant large fish that we just need to have. There's no. So I saw it firsthand um, in the net. In the, and uh, so it did work there as a man, no doubt. Okay, I'll do all the social stuff inside of that, but uh, um, it's really worked there. And, uh, I just, again, you know, that's sort of where I stand. That I'm sort of in the, you know, in the middle. It didn't work there. There's no doubt we have better fishing there than we've ever had on that subject. And, uh, I 
just take this to you and you can see no way. You know, well, it's not necessary. You know, we just don't have that. That's the thing, right? So, of course, I guess it's Oh, Don, Don had Don a call waiting to jump in here. Um, yeah, well, I've always been a proponent. I've said this before. I've always been a proponent to want to make the book, the regulation book, smaller. Uh, here we go, adding yet another category. I asked staff here some time ago at a prior meeting just how many different management programs do we need to manage trout? And I understand this, Chris, this is a another tool, so to speak, like you said, Eric, another tool in the toolbox. But I really have reservations too over having people keep seven, eight, nine inch small fish. Uh, Two, you know, our officers that will have one of these areas in their district. It's another category of signs that have to be printed and posted. Uh, confusion for the public somewhat. Tim, I think you said this morning in the last two years, our license sales are up, what, roughly 13%, I think. So we have a lot of new people that are back with us as anglers. Uh, I could go along with this more if you told me we were going to drop some other management category. Uh, you know, I'd be willing to let me let you try it in that. Uh, but I just at this time, I'm not in favor of adding another management category. So that's my feelings on things. Well, I, you know, I, I think, you know, you look at the, all the, we have a lot of regulations. We have a lot of species, different waterways. It's diverse. I don't know how we're going to peel back to any more than that, Don. I, I don't, I, I don't know. That's sort of, that's not why, it, um, you know, I'm in regard to protecting the wild fit crowd here. And, uh, um, so. But that's just my thoughts now. Thank you, know, thank you. you guys could. I guess you know, it did work there, though, folks. It was. It really. I mean, it made a difference on that section. It's extraordinary fishing now, and that's because of that regulation. And and I, I just might add to uh, Commissioner Hussar that you know think of this on in, in the other in the, on the other side of the coin in that. You know, we have we have waters that are managed with Commonwealth inland water angling regulations that allow for the harvest of five fish. We may see a, a, a stream with certain characteristics that would fit into this program well, and so we would have the opportunity to evaluate its its effectiveness in there and look. At, it would it would serve the same purpose that it would at Penns Creek by protecting the larger fish in the population and allowing that. Um, uh, anglers to harvest two fish. I also look at it. You know, one of the one of the hardest things that we do in fisheries management is to deal with the the people component of things and the human dimension aspects of it. And this is this is somewhat of a compromise between uh, the the Commonwealth Inland Waters Angling Regulations and the uh, Catch and Release Regulations. It provides the anglers that choose to harvest a couple small. Uh, to intermediate size fish that opportunity. And we found that the vast majority are not doing that at Penn's Creek, um, but it does satisfy that social component uh, for the few that do. Yeah, and Chris, you're right on. Um, again, this is about protecting the resource. I mean, that's simple as that. These are wild trout. Um, these are the, our most fragile streams, um, some of our best streams and uh, uh, again, I just, um, you're talking about the larger fish are the better spawners. That's why we have these populations and they're being protected. Um, again, my reservations were just as how it would be used as a tool in the toolbox, knowing that water's in PA, know a lot of the wild trout water's in PA, and whether this could really apply to any of them, um, that would not, 
that would be counterproductive to the fishery itself, the wild trout fishery. I, I can tell you, we're not going to propose anything that's counterproductive to the fishery. Just, just one last comment there, too, looking that we only had three public comments that favored this. I guess I have to question, is it something that the public is really behind and wants? It could be any wild trout stream. And so we're, we're, this is this is to create the regulation and the ability to designate waters into the program. We have not we have not came forward with any waters. And then if we would do that, then the commissioners would have the ability to uh, consider individual waters on their characteristics, whether they're suitable for the program. This is this is simply to, to to create the program to then bring waters to the commissioners for consideration. They could be class A's, they could be class C's, they could be class B's, but they would be wild trout streams. Uh, second question. Um, but there's no consideration about changing the designation of those wild trout. No, there's not. No, th this wouldn't affect the designation, whether it be Class A or, or what we what we uh, rank it as from a biomass standpoint, and it would also not affect any. Any, it, it wouldn't be considered by DEP in Chapter 93 designation. As you know, Class A is, is one of the qualifiers used for uh, ch Chapter 93 high quality cold water fishes. This wouldn't affect that whatsoever. This is a regulatory management program to basically regulate harvest. So, uh, what is the uh, regulatory scheme that From a reproductive standpoint, I think it helps Charlie and wild trout. I guess, uh, this is Commissioner Lewis, I guess that I have a little different perspective than some of my other colleagues around the table. Um, I, I think that. We're giving our staff the ability to come up with some management on some streams that will actually improve them if they feel it will improve them, as they did on the section of Penn Creek, Penn Creek that Commissioner Hussar talks about. I also know that we're, we're, they're not going to come in here and suggest 50 streams being reclassified in one shot. They're going to come in here and say, OK, we got two for you this time. We got three for you that time to, to consider. So we're not talking about a huge number of streams here. Uh, and I think we're going to give them a tool that will make fishing better. And I say that, and I know that those of you who are, are, are very concerned that there should be no kill on wild trout. I am not part of that school. I don't mind if people take wild trout occasionally. I don't want to see them take them to the point where we jeopardize them. But I may be one of the few commissioners that likes to take trout and eat one once in a while. I don't take a lot of them. And I release most of them, but I like that ability. So th for those reasons, I support the proposal. Thanks for the opportunity to present my yeah. Rick, one more. Yeah, and you know, again, and sort of a little what Tim said, if, if we can enhance a wild trout fishery where it eliminates a five creel limit per day with this, where we could it could reper you know, it where it goes to the level of Pence Creek section three. That's that's great. Notwithstanding, I, you know, not even looking at the social aspect of it, because this is about the resource first, 
and that's our policy. So, uh, yeah, with that, I would uh, I would embrace this from that standpoint on a, on a class A water to protect it further from where it is right now. Thanks. That's good enough for me. Call the question. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So this is really the same we're going to have a chance to say yay or nay over everyone they put forward in the future. So and let's have that chance right now. All those in favor of of, aye. Uh, aye. of seconding this motion, signify by saying aye. Let's aye. aye. All those opposed, same sign. Still in between on that. Opposed? Okay. One one opposition motion carried. All right. All right. We're going to move on to the next one, Chris, and then we're going to take a break. Okay. All right, that sounds good to me. Um, this is this is the final piece of, of, of final rulemaking that I'll be presenting before turning it over to Dave Nyhart for the remaining uh, voting items. And this is amendments to uh, basically the same type of an approach that we took with the establishment of the single opening day for trout. It's amendments to uh, various regulations, chapters that pertain to black bass, however. And so when in, in going through uh, and going through the process of, of the single opening day and, and going through the regulation book, staff identified an opportunity to simplify regulations pertaining to black bass while also improving upon the management of that species group and optimizing the fishery. And when I refer to black bass, I'm referring to largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, and spotted bass. And so modifications to black bass regulations pertaining to the start and end of seasons, krill and minimum size limits, and establishing uniformity among lakes, rivers, and streams would allow anglers to more easily interpret regulations. And so from the regulatory simplification uh, standpoint, currently uh, Commonwealth Inland Water Angling Regulations require uh, immediate release of black bass from 1201 on the first Saturday after April 11th to 1201 on the first Saturday after uh, June 11th. And so that's the typical typical closure period during the spawning season for black bass uh, to protect uh, fish during that critical time period in their life cycle. And we are proposing simply to make that a more rec recognizable date. Uh, and so a slight modification to that catch and release period, basically to the second Saturday in April, from from the second Saturday in April to the second Saturday in June, would be much more straightforward and recognizable by anglers for the same reasons we talked about uh, the first Saturday after April 11th in the context of trout management. And it's really uh, not much of a, a change there, uh, date wise on an annual calendar cycle. And so the current inland waters also enact a reduced creel and size limits on different dates for lakes versus streams. So for lakes, we kick into what I'll call the trophy season on November 1st, where the creel and size limits go, the creel limit goes back to four fish and increases to a four, a, the four fish from six fish and increases from 12 inches to 15 inches for a minimum of size. That happens on rivers in October 1st. And so by aligning the start of these trophy seasons between resource categories or between lakes and flowing waters would eliminate any unnecessary, unnecessary regulatory complexity. It would also provide um, uh, continuing to, to provide adequate protection to the black bass populations. And so here's what it would look like in terms of, of the regu regulation chart. 
essentially, again, it's similar to the to the text that you've seen in other regulation charts that are displayed here this afternoon, basically changing the the reference to a, a, a date after uh, something like April 11th to uh, the second Saturday in April and the second Saturday in June. And in the regulations right now, we broke those out into uh, rivers and streams, which is the piece that you see here. We're going to take that language out of rivers and streams, and we eliminated, uh, we, we're proposing to eliminate the entire um, row for, for lakes. And so it's all covered here. All resource categories would be managed in a similar fashion. And so, similar, similarly to uh, the single opening day piece, there, there, there are uh, additional sections where changes will be required. You see those before you. I did not include those in this presentation, but they're provided in your agenda for reference. And a notice of proposed rulemaking was published on September 4th. That's Exhibit N. The commission received a total of two public comments regarding the proposal and neither of those two comments pertain to the proposal. Staff recommend that the commission adopt the amendments as described in the commentary. If adopted, the amendments will go into effect January 1st of 2022. Thank you, Chris. Looking at the recommendation here from staff. I'd Do like I... to make motion to accept the staff recommendation. Okay. Commissioner Anderson made a motion to accept. Okay. Seconded by Commissioner Brock. Questions, comments? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Like sign, opposed? Motion carried. Okay, let's take yeah, 10, 10 minutes. minutes. Take a 10 minute break. Okay, Dave, all yours. All right, uh, thank you, Commissioner Kaufman. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dave Nair. I'm the Chief of Division of Fisheries Management. The next presentation we're gonna cover uh, is a final rulemaking. Uh, this is very similar to the proposed rulemaking that would have been presented back in uh, during the April commission meeting. We're looking to the amendment to uh, 58 PA code 6524, the miscellaneous special regulations, removing Leisure Lake, which is located in Lehigh County. Leisure Lake is a 117-acre impoundment that is owned by the Commonwealth. It's located approximately 20 miles outside of the city of Allentown, which is located in Lehigh County. This impoundment was completely dewatered during 2019 to complete dam and spillway repairs and modifications for DEP's dam safety standards. Prior to the drawdown, it offered angling opportunities for various warm and cool water species. And it was also managed as a stock trout water prior to the drawdown. Some of the restoration activities that occurred while the impoundment was drawn down, a significant habitat enhancement was completed. Uh, following the repairs in 2013, the commission resumed annual adult stocking to provide immediate angling opportunities. This was done through um, stocking of warm water and cool water species uh, to initiate and to develop the fishery from 2013 through 2015. This impoundment is still receiving maintenance stockings of select warm cool water species um, through this year as well. Beginning in 2013, the lake was placed into the miscellaneous special regulations program. This was done to protect the developing warm water and cool water fish, popu fish populations from harvest during the rebuild, but also allow for the harvest of trout. So following the refill, uh, it was also included back into the stock trout waters program. So fish population and, and monitoring and also touch a little bit about the management of the current management of the lake. Black bass and panfish populations were evaluated from 2016 through May of 2021. Sport fish abundance uh, and size structure improved steadily to levels that we feel that it can sustain some level of harvest. For that reason, staff recommend removing Leaser Lake from the miscellaneous special, reg miscellaneous special regulations program. If this regulation is removed, Leaser Lake will be proposed for designation into the big bass panfish enhancement, and the stock trout waters open to year-round fishing programs. All other fish, uh, fish, fish species will be managed under Commonwealth inland regulations. A notice of proposed rulemaking was published in the PA Bulletin on June 5th of 2021. It's also Exhibit O of your, um, in your agenda. 
The commission did not receive any public comments regarding the proposal. Staff recommend the commission adopt the amendments as set forth in the notice of proposed rulemaking. If adopted, the amendments will go into effect on January 1st of 2022. Thanks, Dave. You see what staff recommended to remove Lisa Lake. Um, and I'd like to make the motion to accept the staff recommendation. I would second that. Any comment questions? Hearing none, all those in favor of the staff recommendation, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Gonna make a lot of guys happy. Good. <laughs> all right, thank you. So the next presentation, we're gonna shift focus away from role makings and go to designations. Um, and this ties directly into the previous previous uh, final rulemaking presentation for Leaser Lake. So now that th the motion has been made to remove Leaser Lake from the miscellaneous special regulations program, staff are going to make the recommendation to add the big bass, pan fish, and stock trout waters open year round fishing programs to Leaser Lake. As I previously mentioned, it's a 117 acre impoundment owned by the Commonwealth, located in Lehigh County, outside of the borough or the city of Allentown. Also, um, previously mentioned that it does support a diverse warm water and cool water fisheries, including crappie, yellow perch, largemouth bass, and tiger muscalunge. The black, black bass and panfish populations were evaluated um, from 2016 through May 2020 through, through May of this year. And also mentioned that it is still included in the stock trout waters program. Here's some information. It may be a little hard to see some of these graphs, but this is all provided in the packet that you guys have before you. The sport fish abundance and size structure improved steadily. Um, that staff believe now that some levels of, of harvest can be sustained on this uh, water body. We propose to manage under big bass and panfish enhancement regulations. And looking at the graphs here, you can see some of the catch data from this year's survey that were that was done. Um, targeting both panfish and largemouth bass using multiple um, assessment methods for the panfish. We're looking at, at using trap net gear and electrofishing for the largemouth. But here you can kind of see and get an understanding of what these populations look like. So it is managed as a stock trout water. Uh, currently, stock trout waters are closed from the third Monday in February to opening day for regular trout season. Applying an open year round program to this would increase and diversify outlet opportunities on this water body for resident warm water and cool water fishes, while also allowing uh, start stock trout angling to occur during the extended season. Regulated as a standard stock trout water during the extended season, um, also waters managed as stock trout waters over your own fishing are open to angling from the third Monday of February through opening day. Although fishing is permitted for, although targeting trout is permitted during this time period, it may, it has to be done on a catch and release basis. You're not required to have a current trout permit to fish in lakes and ponds that are managed as stock trout waters open year round fishing. Although if people do um, collect and, and harvest trout, they must possess a valid permit. As Chris mentioned before, uh, this, this type of regulation or Designation isn't applied to all of our lakes. Really, it's only applied where there's a good warm water and cool water angling opportunities that exist year round, while also trying to provide stock trout angling opportunities. As Chris mentioned, there's only 47 of the, of the 128 lakes. So less than 40% of all the lakes that we manage as stock trout waters really qualify to be included in this stock trout waters open your program. And you can see these are lake is 117 acre impoundment, so it's a very good size impoundment. And most of the lakes that are managing this program are, are decent size. So it's not the typical stuff that we've um, had concerns with, you know, with Whipple and um, other various small impoundments. So it's usually applied to bigger waters that do have and can provide year round opportunities for warm, cool water species. I noticed the proposed designation was published in the PA Bulletin on September 4th of this year. It's Exhibit P. The Commission did not receive any public comments regarding the proposal. Staff recommend the commission add Leaser Lake, Lehigh County to the Big Bass, Panfish Enhancement, and Stock Trout Waters open year-round fishing programs. 
If adopted, these designations will go into effect on January 1st of 2022. Okay, review the proposal. We can take put Lisa Lake in the big bass program. We we'll hear a motion to accept direct res, um, recommendation. Commissioner Anderson, second. Second. Commissioner Brock, any questions, comments? All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. So the next presentation will cover the designation of Opossum Lake in Cumberland County, adding to the stock trout waters open year round fishing program. It's a 47 acre lake owned by the Commonwealth. It's located in Cumberland County, just outside of the bor borough of Carlisle. Currently, it's managed as a stock trout water, and it's, it means it's closed to fishing from the third Monday in February through the opening day of trout season. It does support a diverse, warm, cool water um, fishing opportunities, including bluegill, crappie, and largemouth bass. And this water was designated into the big bass and panfish enhancement programs back at the January um, commission meeting as well. So putting an open year round designation would increase and diversify angling opportunities for resident warm water and cool water fisheries, as well as continuing to provide stock trout angling opportunities during the extended season. So waters managed under stock trout waters open year round fishing. Again, a lot of this information was covered in the Leisure Lake presentation. It's regulated as a standard stock trout water during the regular and stagnant seasons, but it is open to fishing from the third Monday in February through opening day. No trout may be had in possession or, or harvested during this time period. A current trout permit is not required to fish in lakes under this designation. And as mentioned before, it's applied to waters where good warm water angling opportunities exist on a year round basis. Um, and seasonal angling opportunities are also present for stock trout. A notice of proposed designation was published in the PA Bulletin on September 4th. Exhibit Q, the commission did not receive any public comments regarding this proposal. <clears throat> Staff recommend the commission add Possum Lake, Cumberland County to the stock trout waters open year round fishing program. If adopted, the designation will go into effect on January 1st of 2022. Okay, recommendation has been made by staff to add Possum Lake to Stock Trout Waters Open Year Round Fishing Program. Do I have a motion to accept? Commissioner would, Charlesworth? I would second that. Seconded by Commissioner Small. Questions, comments? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, like sign. Motion carried. Okay, thank you. So this next presentation is gonna be nearly identical to the presentation that you just saw, but only it's gonna to pertain to Lake Perez, which is located in Huntington County. Uh, I'd like to add it to the Stock Trout Waters Open Year Round Fishing Program. So this impoundment is set roughly 72 acres in size. size. It's owned by Pennsylvania State University. It's located in Northern Huntington County, um, just south of the borough of State College. It's currently just managed as a stock trout water, meaning that angling is not allowed during the extended season. Or I'm sorry, it's not allowed from the third Monday in February through the beginning of regular season for trout. It supports a diverse warm cool water and warm water and cool water fisheries. It has a very good population of black crappie, bluegill, and largemouth bass. This water was also added to the panfish enhancement program during the January 2021 commission meeting. Open year round designation would increase and diversify angling opportunities for resident warm and cool water fishes, as well as provide opportunities for anglers to catch stock trout. So again, very similar. Um, so waters, current, waters that are managed as stock trout, waters open year round fishing. They're regulated as a standard stock trout water during the regular and extended season, but they're open to angling from the third Monday in February through the open day of trout. Um, again, no trout may be killed or had in possession during this time period. A trout permit is not required to fish in, in these impoundments. And as mentioned before, these uh, open year round fishing designation 
is apply the waters where good warm water angling opportunities exist on a year round basis while still trying to provide opportunities for anglers to catch some stock trout. A notice of proposed designation was published in the PA Bulletin on September 4th, 2021. It's Exhibit R. Um, similar to the others, the Commission did not receive any public comments regarding the proposal. Staff recommend the Commission at Lake Perez, located in Huntington County, the Stock Trout Waters Open Year Round Fishing Program. If adopted, the designation will go into effect on January 1st of 2022. I'd like to make a motion to accept the staff recommendation. Hey, Commissioner Anderson. I'll second Commissioner Alley. Any comments, questions? I just have one question. Okay. Uh, this I'm sure will be approved here in a moment. Will it be in the 2022 fishing summary? Would it make that cut off? Yes, Commissioner Anderson, uh, that's, that's a good question, a good point. All of this stuff that is being presented to you today, whether it's a designation or final rulemaking, now that it's approved by you guys, will be reflected in the most okay. in the 2022 Great. summary book. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Hearing none, we're going to call for a vote. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Class A wild trout streams. <clears throat> okay, so the next presentation will cover the proposed changes to the list of Class A wild trout streams. This presentation is going to be very similar to what has been presented during your fisheries and hatcheries committee meeting. I'm going to feel it's important to go over this again, just since we're probably touching a broader audience today. Um, so, what is a Class A wild trout designation, and really, what is its importance? Class A wild trout designation is a science-based designation that recognizes unique and special resources of a strong and sustainable wild trout population um, that can support a high quality recreational fishery. So again, these class A waters are really the best of what Pennsylvania has to offer in regard to wild trout resources. It's a resource-based management conservation of the wild trout stream and really resource-based management is at the core of our agency's mission. Streams designated as Class A are also afforded increased levels of water quality and habitat protection, as touched on during an earlier pre presentation. Once a stream is designated as Class A, it, if warranted, uh, we'll petition, I shouldn't say petition, we'll provide information to DEP asking them to redesignate a stream to the appropriate water quality level, which in the case of Class A waters is HQ, um, is HQ CWF designation. Also, an additional benefit of Class A streams is these are open to year on angling. So, as mentioned before in some of the previous presentations, the stock trout water is closed to fishing during uh, from the first from the third Monday in February to opening day. Whereas a water that's managed as a Class A and is not stocked provides for year round angling opportunities. So, you know, not only uh, is it being protected as it should be, we're also providing additional angling opportunities for anglers to fish on a year round basis. Also, this was identified as an issue in our latest strategic plan for the management of trout fisheries in Pennsylvania. Um, it really to staff to develop an annually update and prioritize list of stream sections to be surveyed that likely support class A wild trout populations. So a lot of these are streams that are identified uh, through the honest test program. So as cooperators go out and even our internal staff go out and survey a stream for the first time, gathering some of that baseline data Gives us an idea if it's worth going back and revisiting, giving it a more thorough investigation, determining if it actually does sustain a class A population. Also streams where previous commission surveys documented high to moderate uh, biomasses in the past. So there's maybe some streams that staff have visited in past years that now um, are worth going back and, and sampling again. Also streams that AFMs determined to be good candidates to support class A populations. And also some information that we get from uh, other groups, conservation groups and anglers that kind of point us in give point us in a direction that makes us believe that some of these are going back worth going back to and resurveying. <clears throat> so recent surveys documented class A wild trout populations in seven streams, uh, totaling nine stream sections. Three of these stream sections were stocked by the commission, two of which are also stocked by cooperative nursery. 
Um, three streams are stocked by cooperative nursery, but not the commission. There's also one stream that is not stocked by the commission or cooperative nursery. <clears throat> so reallocation of hatchery trout that were previously stocked in a, a water recently designated as class A. So staff really want to find an alternative stocking location um, for all waters that were regionally designated class A by the commission um, that really don't apply for a stocking exemption. So what we look to do is it's always a priority to stock fish in close proximity to the stream section that was removed from the program. So <clears throat> if a water is, is located in Tioga County, obviously it's our first and highest priority to find a nearby water to stock these fish. It doesn't make any sense and it certainly doesn't benefit the local residents of that stream if we now say your fish are going to be stocked in Philadelphia County. So certainly a high priority alternative stocking location in close proximity to where the original to where the fish were originally stocked. We can do that by establishing a new stock trout water. Uh, we can increase the allocation rate on a current stock trout water. Uh, we could add a second in season. Or another thing we can do is also we can extend the current stocks out, extend the current section limits of stock trout water. So there's a various variety of ways that we can um, a thing we can do in a local area to keep the fish as close to, to where they originally stocked as possible. <clears throat> Priority is given to waters with high recreational use, which consists of road access, parking, uh, and public ownership. ownership. Um, so again, looking for areas that we, we can stock these fish that they're gonna be utilized by the anglers. <clears throat> so now we'll go through um, the streams. And again, all this information is in your packet. So if some of this is hard to read, uh, it, it'll be in your agenda as well. So the first stream is Baker Creek. It's located in Potter County. Um, you can see it's nearly five miles in length. It was sampled in 2020. And you can see here it has a mixed species fishery dominated by mostly brown trout, but wild brook trout were documented. <clears throat> this water is not stocked by our agency, by the commission, but it is stocked by a cooperative nursery. In 2021, they stocked the stream section with roughly 190 adult trout. As mentioned before, anytime we're, water, we're removing a water from the program, we're looking to identify alternative stocking locations, whether it's a water we stock or it's a water that's stocked by a cooperative nursery. So you can see here a couple options that we provided to the cooperative nursery. And I will say that um, fishery staff and hatchery staff are working together um, with the co-op to identify some additional stocking locations if, if needed. So just because it's not shown here. There's certainly more than these two stocking options available for a co-op. So it's ongoing to work with those guys, again, to make sure that we're providing the best place to stock these fish for anglers to use them. And here's a map that shows um, the area. You can see that this stream is located outside of Powdersport. The blue line is Baker Creek, and you can see that it dumps into the Allegheny River, which is also a stock trout fishery, and then the streams highlighted in, in orange are a couple options that were initially identified of nearby locations that the co-op nursery can now stock these fish. So again, we're removing the water from an area and we're trying to do our best to keep those fish uh, in the same general vicinity. The next water is Cold Stream Dam, um, or just, I'm sorry, Cold Stream Section 2, located in Center County. This is just outside of the borough of Phillipsburg. It's a little over a mile and a quarter in length. Um, it's predominantly made up of brown trout, but there are brook trout present, uh, not only in this section, but there's brook trout present in this stream sections above there. It was stocked by our agency with roughly 1,500 fish in 2021. It was not stocked by any cooperative nurseries last year. The commission has identified some alternative stocking locations, uh, three locations in particular, Black Shannon Creek sections two and four, and then also Cold Stream Dam itself. So Cold Stream Section 2 dumps into Cold Stream Dam. So some of the fish that were previously allocated to Cold Stream will be dumped or will be stocked in Cold Stream Dam. So right in the immediate vicinity of, of where they're originally stocked. <clears throat> Again, a map depicting, um, so you can see spatially where this is all at. You can see the blue line outside of the borough of Phillipsburg indicates that that's Cold Stream. Uh, the orange dot is the dam. So some of the fish will be allocated in the Cold Stream Dam itself. And also you can see the other two orange lines um, be sections two and sections four of Bill Mack, Black and Shannon Creek. Again, so just right down really, I think it's Route 504, not too far down from the original stocking location 
is where these fish will now be stopped. Hey, where's the lake up there? Coast, it's, yeah, Coast Stream Dam, it, it's, the, it, the orange dot is covering the entire impoundment. Okay, so it's right there with the orange dot. Right, and it's right, it's right in the heart of Phillipsburg. Yeah, right so. Yep. So the next two we'll cover will be the middle branch and the west branch of Genesee River. Both of these are located in Potter County. This is some of the few water that Pennsylvania actually has in the Genesee Basin. Um, you can see both of these in total. We're looking at nearly 11 miles of streams that we designated Class A. <clears throat> Excuse me, middle branch is made up predominantly of, of brown trout, whereas the west branch does have a mix. But again, it, it's, it's um, heavier towards the brown trout population compared to brook trout. In total, uh, we stocked roughly 1,400 fish in the middle branch and 1,100 fish in the, I'm sorry, 1,300 fish in the middle branch, 1,100 fish in the west branch. The cooperative nursery up there also stocked both of these streams with roughly 1,800 fish. The commission um, has Oswego Creek, uh, which is a very popular trout stream in that area. Up until last year, only section, the most downstream section, section four, was the lowest section we stocked. Staff working in conjunction with law enforcement have went out and been knocking on doors and assessing that stream section and have identified it as a suitable candidate to add to the program. This is really good because in Potter County, this is going to flow through Shingle Town or Shingle House, which you know for Potter County is a fairly populated place. So we're expecting very good use of these fish up there. And also, as mentioned, the co-ops are stocking these these waters as well. Here's a list of waters that we've identified as potential candidates uh, for them to shift their allocation towards. All again. All of these are in Potter County. Here's a map just showing that you can see Genesee, the town of Genesee, the West Branch and the Middle Branch that we're um, proposing today, and then the orange um, poly lines just depicting some alternative stocking locations uh, where these fish will now go. There's three waters on this next slide. All three of them are located in, in Clinton County, just outside of the town of Renova, um, which is kind of north central Clinton County. We have two sections on Patty Run, section 02 and section 03, and also a section, section one on Shin Town from the headwaters to the mouth. You can see here that all of these um, do comprise some component of brook trout in the fishery. Uh, especially when you're looking at, at Shintown. This is a quite an impressive stream for that area. It, it only has brook trout present, which is certainly something special and unique as well. None of these three streams are stocked by our agency, but all three of them are stocked by a cooperative nursery. And you can see here that each one of these sections receives roughly 800 fish on an annual basis. Um, <clears throat> the next part, the stocking alternatives, Here's two streams that we've identified in close proximity to Renova. We think it'd be good, good candidates for the co-ops to shift some of their allocation to. Again, uh, we're still working with the cooperative nursery unit and the co-op folks to continue to identify some additional waters if needed. And here's a map. You have Shintown on the left-hand side and Patty Run in the center. Um, so these two stream sections, section one of Shintown and sections two and three will be, um, that were traditionally stocked by the co-op will now be stocked. Um, those fish will be stocked elsewhere. And you can kind of see, it's hard to throw it all on, on one map and still make it easy for everybody to read, but the two orange lines depict the two stream sections that were initially identified as alternative stocking locations. The last one, there's two streams on here. There's Lorley Fork section one and Patty Run section one, both again located in Clinton County outside of Renova. Uh, both of these contain brook trout. Uh, you can see here that the section one of Laurel Fork, which is a tributary to Young Woman's Branch, and then Patty Run, uh, we just talked about the sections two and three, tributary to the West Branch. The commission does not stock these two sections, nor do, does a uh, cooperative nursery. So for those reasons, there's no stocking alternatives uh, identified. And here's just a map showing you uh, where those waters are located. So a list of proposed designations is available online on our commission's website, and it's also included in today's meeting agenda. Uh, this information was provided to the commissioners well in advance of the commission meeting as well. And this information was also presented 
during the fisheries hatchery briefing committee meeting that took place on September 15th as well. All copper nurseries impacted by the proposed designations have been contacted by PFBC staff. Staff will provide a detailed summary of alternative stocking locations for the waters removed from the program due to Class A designation. This is something that we do every year. Uh, every April, um, every April issue, March, April issue of the uh, Angler and Boater, this information is presented. It's also presented in our commission press releases, and then it will also do a social media blast on various platforms, just letting people know that these waters are no longer stocked and where the alternative stocking locations will be. I notice the proposed designation was published on August 21st of this year. It's Exhibit T in your agenda. The commission received 135 public comments regarding the proposed designations. 130 supported the proposal. One supports the designation of a specific water. One opposes the proposal and one opposes the, opposes the designation of a specific water. And two do not pertain to the proposal. <clears throat> Staff recommend the commission add nine stream sections to its class A wild trout streams list. It's described in the commentary. If approved, these additions will go into effect upon publication of a second notice in the Pennsylvania Bulletin. Okay, thank you, Dave. We've all seen the proposed changes to the list of Class A wild trout streams and the staff recommendation. Do I have a motion to accept the recommendation? Sure. Uh, did you have a discussion with Carter County Anglers about the Genesee River and the West Bridge? We uh, what what were their feelings about this particular stock? Yeah, so how it worked is we provided information to Brian McHale with the co-op new co-op nursery unit. He contacted the individuals of Potter County Anglers. They, I guess, were dissatisfied with the idea that they couldn't stock in those areas. The following um, the guidelines we have, we informed them that we were all going to propose for class A designation. We would work with those guys to find alternative stocking locations, which we have. I know that some of the initial waters that we provide them, they kind of had a few issues with. So I personally sat down with Brian McHale last week. We identified some adult, uh, additional stocking locations that will be, excuse me, provided to them following the commission meeting. Have you two met with them in person? I have never, I've not in regard to this, but certainly one of the things we discussed is even get on the phone and talking with those guys. So I guess what it really boils down to is we're willing to work as an agency with these co-ops to identify a suitable location. My my concern here is if we approve these two waters, the Genesee River and the West Branch today, that will be three stock trout waters that we will have removed from Potter County. Uh, I'm glad the wild trout are there. But I have concerns, too, with what we're removing from the stock water list. There's a lot of people that go to Potter County. They like to fish for stock trout. They like to harvest some fish. Uh, I would prefer to see these two waters made class A with uh, an exemption here that they could continue to be stalked by both the commission and and the club there with with their fish. Uh, I I guess I, I look at it that Rocco, would you and I discuss 12% of our wild trout waters are in in Potter County. We're sort of getting to the point here with Potter County that pretty soon we're not going to have any stocked waters at all for the people that enjoy fishing over stocked stocked yeah. trout. I agree with you, Donnie, but I think if we um, defer to Commissioner Brock, I think um, he wrote a summary of uh, Class A waters in Potter County that it's somewhere around 12% of the total in the state, and now we're going to add even more to it um, we've got good co-op hatcheries up there. They have nowhere to put their fish. I think we ought to do a little more science before we... It's not all about science sometimes, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. I mean, uh, 
And I, I and in full agreement with Commissioner Anderson, I, I don't think that taking more stock trout waters away from a county that doesn't have that much to begin with is, is fair to the county. I have a question. The Clinton County, the two springs there that you would suggest as alternative waters and never know. Mm -hmm. and have some discussion with them and to hear their concerns in person. Yeah, as I mentioned, I went during the conversation and, with- And a lot, of, a lot of this effect from whatever the situation is here, which I'm afraid it may go that we take them off the stocking list, a lot of people won't realize that it's happened until it gets to be stocking time and right in the trout season. Commissioner Brock, it's your. Yeah, I, I would just say that your district, and you had a comment. Well, the, these, the designation of these streams, particularly in Potter County, really, I guess, kicked off a spirit of discussion that went on. We've been following some of us for the last couple of weeks. Um, I think there's complications with the Genesee and our ability to stock, which makes it even makes the situation even more confusing because, you know, and I don't, maybe I'll let Tim explain it quickly, but it's, it's basically a situation where they probably were no longer going to be able to stock the Genesee anyways, because uh, the, the Genesee is running into the Great Lakes. They have different kinds of regulations. Tim, you can follow up with us on, uh, or follow up with them after, but I think what, what I'm sensing is more good than harm is going to come out of this. We're to the point, I think, with Class A streams where our, our level of understanding is increasing. I think we're running into situations we've never run into before where they're, where they're starting to be concentrated. And I guess we talked about, you know, would it be good to put some motion out today? And I think at the, at the end of the discussion, um, the feeling is it really should go back to the, to the fisheries committee to, to discuss it because whether or not we, you know, slow down with, with the Genesee, if the Genesee is class A, it needs, you know, it, it's, it's fact. Um, the fact that they can't stock it, even if it wasn't Class A, is a whole different part of the story, which complicates it. I think that the challenge before us is they're running out of water to stock, and yet these are our partners, and we're kind of locking them in. But I think we have to be very careful in the path we go down with the exemption. I think something needs to be done, but I don't think it can be done on the fly. And, and it, it, you know, as much as none of us need it, it's, it's going to be a lot more work to figure out what exactly that looks like. Um, so I, I, I think that, it, again, it, it triggered a whole number of um, conversations that I think were, were really good. I mean, I think we're, we're, we're realizing where we're strong, we're realizing maybe where we need to do more. Um, and I'm hoping, and I, you know, Dan and I talked about it, and we just thought that the fisheries committee were to be, you know, fully vetted and, 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 and fully you know, it's kind of an opportunity. We came, upon, we came upon some problems that I think we can address, but I don't think, I don't think it can be done as quick as with one motion. I think it has to be a little bit more time, a little bit more thoughtful, and and I I think we can come up with something and, and hopefully have something for for the January meeting. And if, if it is another exemption or another solution, there would still be time to implement that before um, the season starts. So that, that's kind of where we are. It, it's a pretty confusing issue. There's a lot of moving parts. Um, yeah, so I'll let it go with that. In the, in the lead up to the recommendation, 
if you, you know, I don't think you have to go back, but it did seem like the public comments were strongly in favor of of this designation. So, uh, you know, in that respect, Don, what you're talking about, it sounded like the public is behind it. Go ahead. Well, yeah, our, our, the way we collect comments is not necessarily, you know, scientific per se. I understand. Um, I, I guess my feeling is I still support these. I don't think I don't think Baker is that big is as big of an issue. And really, the yeah, swale we're going to have to, you know, in terms of Potter County anglers, they weren't going to be able to stock it anyways, regardless of designation. So I, I don't know if the answer is. To not designate it because I think as, as we talked about it, it, either it is or it isn't. You know, and voting against it, um, it's probably more of a vote against how it's going to be managed in the future. But really, you can't deny the science. It, it is or it isn't. So, um, not designating these doesn't really solve the problem in terms of of, of um, stock waters. You know, one of the other big concerns is you have Austin, which isn't a you know it's big by Potter County standards. You have um, Estello, you've got a lot of camps there. So there's just a lot of factors that I think we have to wade through as we look at this to figure out what is the right thing to do. And part of that solution may be you know having a meeting with these guys in in in, in um, this club and finding out what what are our what are our Bill mentioned that we kind of see and maybe comment just on that and what, just so everybody understands. Sure, I could do it, but then if Dave, you could do a better job of explaining the, the, the disease factors there. Could you just explain about the Genesee, why we wouldn't be stocking that anyway? Yeah, so as part of the Great Lakes Fish uh, Fisheries Commission, the um, fish health group that our agency sets on as well, our pathology unit leader, Koji Yamashita, is our representative. As part of that commitment, our agency has, has said we're going to fall in line with everybody else and any water that dumps into the Great Lakes, which Genesee would dump into Lake Ontario, we're committed to the stocking fish that are free of VHN, uh, IPN, and whirling disease, I believe. So knowing that hatcheries have that, um, you know, we're not we're not going to move forward with stocking fish. So we've committed to stock the Genesee branch itself, which is not Class A. Internally, fish from quarry hatchery will be coming over. To supplement those stock. So, regardless or not if this is Class A designation, fish that are tested as being devoid of one of those diseases would not be permitted to stock anywhere within that watershed. VHN is what? If you could clarify that for for Why everyone, IPN is infectious pancreatic necrosis. I I know what that is. VHN is viral hemorrhaging septicemia. I believe is what it is. I believe those are the three of the greatest concern. And IPM is one we were concerned about because of the origin. It's it, where the fish were coming from. The quarry hatchery is an IPM free facility. So we can take our fish from quarry, stock them in the part of the Genesee that's not class A. Potter County Angers, though, doesn't have that same IPM free status. And so therefore they would not be left. Sock fish there, um, regardless of the class A status to close in late year. Or excuse me, Lake Ontario. Right. Better spring is IPN free, isn't it? I don't have a, I was I don't know it. if they're is better spring IPN free. It's better for IPN free, but every year I think it's part of IPN is something that's worked on there. Or is it ready to get one of I understand there. For the record, that's not saying if they're they're good, they're raising good fish. It's just we can't guarantee that they're free of you know. I don't, we're talking at the microscopic level, so I mean, it's, I don't we don't want to give the impression that they're not raising good fish. It's just right. we can't guarantee 
that, that traces aren't there, correct? Is that that's correct? Never stock fish that are symptomatic or have anything like that, but they're not there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so can, can I ask if we were going to exempt, so we have another provision that allows an exemption to continue to stock notwithstanding the class A designation, wouldn't we be applying that at this stage? And if so, do we know whether any of these meet those criteria? Commissioner Pastore, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take a shot at that. So. We do have some different additional information. I believe a lot of it was included in the packets that you guys had before you. Um, so looking at the internal criteria, if you're looking at for commission stock fish, uh, two things really jump out. You know, one of them is, you know, the West Branch does have brook trout in it. Uh, although the middle branch section two does not, section one does support a class A brook trout population. But most importantly, when we talk about use, you know, really efficiency, getting the best out of the fish we're stocking, opening day angler counts were conducted on the middle branch and the west branch this year and i think one of them had seven or eight people on opening day in the morning fishing and the other one had eight or nine i'm not exactly sure the numbers but again it, it just shows that you know these are not some of the very high use waters that would warrant and certainly i think they fell in the in the lowest fifth percentile of our opening day angler accounts statewide so they're certainly not high use waters it's certainly nothing like you know body Oak creek in center county or penn's creek you know the ones that that are currently on the program. So, so one of the things we talked about since they were losing the stocking opportunity in those three streams, is there other alternatives um, that could be looked at? I mean, and the problem is when you look at this section of of Southwest um, Carter County, it's 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 pretty packed with, with regulated water. So one of the one of the thoughts was to go back and look at one of the other streams um, that might make sense. It's a class A, but to if you were gonna if you were gonna do this to do it, lay it over. The problem is I don't know that we currently have among our 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 list of exemptions one that cleanly fits this, although I'm not sure that this is gonna be um, the only one of the last time we run into this problem. So again, that's why we wanted to take it back to fisheries, because we don't want to just throw something out there that doesn't make any sense so you could have, you know, everybody could be screaming for um, exemptions. I think this is a fairly unique um, situation. It may not be the only one we ever run into like this, but I think, you know, I think everybody knows where I stand with wild trout and what I'd like to see, but I, but I also think that um, there are gonna be times when we have, to, we have to bend and give ourselves more time to show these communities what class A streams can be. And we haven't, we haven't always done that as well as we thought. Thank you. 
Uh, before we get into the procedural stuff with the motion, and I will not make another motion. Um, you know, if, if this is going to go back to, I mean, I don't know what we're going to do on this motion. Okay. If we're going to go back, we need to have this discussion in the fishery. I, we have, I mean, it, look, I, I, you know, I've said it before. This agency was not founded on stocking trout in Pennsylvania. It was, it's a conservation. That's why we were founded. And uh, uh, so that said, going forward now, obviously we have issues with stocking over wild trout. Um, uh, um, I'm glad we're going to move. If we're not going to vote on, we're not managing these per se on this vote. Okay. And that really is a separate issue of what we have in front of us. Well, we have a lot of issues and uh, these are, these are going to be tough choices. I mean, this, this agency, I've been on this board for 6 years. It's been the same discussions. In prior years and, uh, 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 you know, again, when you're looking at the resource, it makes me easy to make the decision. I know it's not, we, we differ on that. Um, this doesn't affect our stocking program. We'll find another stream. It creates more opportunities for angling if we want that. Um, uh, these waters cannot handle, these wild trout waters are fragile. They can't handle the pressure um, as a stock trout stream. And they're gonna, they're gonna destroy the resource with that. Um, so, but we'll wait to the meeting to have this. If that's the way this is gonna flow, uh, I just wanted to make sure we weren't. Yeah, as long as we weren't going. Yeah, okay. I'd like, I'd like to go back to the recommendation and ask for a motion to approve the recommendation made for these changes to the list of class A wild trout streams that was presented. Do we have a motion to, to move the recommendation? With staff's recommendation. With staff recommended right there. I just want to make sure. <laughs> yes. We're, we're... Yes, I, I will make that motion. Okay. Second. Is there a second? Richard Lewis, second. Uh, the motion was made by Commissioner Hussar, seconded by Commissioner Lewis. Any further comment on, on their staff recommendation that's in front of us? Hearing none, I'll move it to a vote. All those in favor of the staff recommendation as presented, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, let me go back to a hand vote. Those that signified by saying aye, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six. Those that it signified seven, excuse me, no. Two, two, is it two no votes, three no votes? Bill, you can't vote twice. <laughs> Okay, motion carried. I want to make sure. <laughs> Both your hands go up. Yeah. You abstain. Okay, and one one abstain abstention. All right. All right. Thank you. And and as discussed in, during that discussion, um, we're going to pass it on to the committee to explore. Further option there. I just, I mean, I hope, is that something we can meet in person with, Dan? I mean, it's, and spend more than 10 minutes on a Zoom call. I, I, it, or it could be multiple. Do you got to drink the water, Dave? <clears throat> Move on to the next one. Yeah, so next presentation is going to be the classification of the wild trout streams, uh, proposed additions. One revision and one amendment to the list. Uh, 
this presentation isn't going to provide all the data for each specific stream section, but again, it is in your agenda as well. And it was provided to the commissioners in advance of today's committee or today's commission meeting for review. A notice of proposed designation was published on August 21st of this year, Exhibit B. A list of proposed designations is also available on the commission's website, and as mentioned before, is provided in your agenda today. The commission received a total of 123 public comments regarding the proposed designations. 121 support the proposal, and two do not pertain to the proposal. Staff recommend the commission add five new waters to the commission's list of wild trout streams, revise the section limits of one water currently listed, and amend the name of one water currently listed as set forth set forth in a notice of proposed designation. If approved, these these additions will go into effect upon publication of a second notice in the Pennsylvania Bulletin. Motion to accept the staff recommendation. Yes, sir. Comment is question. Hearing none. All those in favor of the staff recommendation and motion. Okay, so next we have the removal of Somerset Lake located in Somerset County from the Big Bass program. Somerset Lake is 253 acres in size. It's owned by the Commonwealth and it's located in Somerset County just outside the borough limits of Somerset. This lake was completely dewatered in 2017 to complete dam and spillway repairs and modifications for DEP's dam safety standards. Prior to the drawdown, it offered angling for warm and cool water fisheries. Uh, this lake was not included in the stock trout program prior to it being drawn down. Repairs to the dam and spillway are expected to be completed very soon during the fall of 2021, with refilling initiated soon after that. It would initiate stock and rebuild the fishery in late fall 2021 with fingerling plants to select warm and cool water uh, fishes. This lake was added to the catch and release lakes program during the April 2021 commission meeting. This was done to protect the developing warm and cool water uh, population. For that reason, this lake must be removed from the big bass program. A notice of proposed designations was published on September 4th, exhibit W. The commission did not receive any public comments regarding the proposal. Staff recommend the commission remove Somerset Lake, Somerset County for the Big Bass program. If approved, the designation will go into effect upon publication of a second notice in the Pennsylvania Bulletin. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Anderson. Is there a second? Commissioner Ally? Second? Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Removal of Raccoon Creek. Okay, so I believe this will be the last presentation of the day. Um, another designation removal of Raccoon Creek State or Raccoon Creek State Park Upper Pond, um, also known as the Group Camping Area Lake, located in Beaver County from the Catch and Release Lakes Program. It's roughly an eight acre lake in size and it's owned by the uh, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and managed by the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. It's located in Beaver County, about 30 miles outside of the city of Pittsburgh. Um, during early winter of 2022, likely in January, the pond will be completely dewatered in preparation for a flood plan restoration project that is planned for later on in 2022. The dam will be permanently removed and a natural stream channel of Traverse Creek will be restored. The commission, uh, in cooperation with DCNR, will perform a fish salvage prior to the drawdown. Again, this is likely going to occur sometime in the beginning of January. The season size and curl limits for all species was lifted on July 17th of 2021. Um, this was published in the PA Bulletin also on July 17th of 2021. And really the intent was to encourage anglers to harvest fish in this impoundment prior to the fish salvage occurring. Since the lake will be dewatered, permanently dewatered, and the stream channel will be restored, there's no need for this lake to be included uh, in the catch, catch and release lakes program. 
A notice of proposed designation was published on September 4th. It's Exhibit X. Uh, the commission did not receive any public comments regarding the proposal. Staff recommend the commission remove Raccoon Creek State Park Upper Group Upper or Group Camping Area Lake Beaver County from the Catch Release Lakes Program. If approved, the designation will go into effect upon publication of the second notice in the PA Bulletin. Hey, do I have a recommendation, or excuse me, a motion to accept the recommendation from staff to remove Raccoon Creek from the Catch and Release Lakes program? Commissioner Ally, seconded by Commissioner Anderson. Any comment? Um, I have one of my many. They, on this fish salvage, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it has not occurred yet, correct? Correct. It, it was. Where a, we intend to put those fish. Are we going to put them in Raccoon Lake? Yep, just a few miles downstream of their yes, current location. Right down the creek. Yep, yep. Okay, thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Okay, any further comments? All those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. All right, thank you, Dave. Thank you. Appreciate it. All that everything you did, putting that together. And working with us and all that. Yes. Uh, back back to uh, in the Genesee River and the West Branch there, when we talked about the IPN and VHN. Uh, my understanding of IPN once that you have it in a water source or passed on from fish to fish uh, through spawning, you will always have it. Uh, do we ever look at any wild trout that we collect from any waters to determine if we have IPN in them? Can Chris or Brian, can you answer anything on that? I can say that the one we do check every year. Uh, Commissioner? The one we do check every year are the steelhead in Lake Erie. Those fish are sampled for IPN through the, the milt and the ovarian fluid. And we see many, many clean years with an occasional year where the IPN does show up. But since we have started the IPN monitoring and only reproducing fish that are IPN free, we have seen a, a decrease from decades ago when it was first started. I guess, I guess my concern would be a bit was VHN, and I really don't know anything about VHN. I think you meant VHS when you were saying that. V VHF or VHN? VHS. S VHS, viral hemorrhagic septicemia. Correct. Okay. And I have heard of that. Uh, if it was already there in the water, I guess I'd have to question if it's always going to be there. That would be my concern or question. Yes, yeah, as, as part of the uh, the Great Lakes Fish Commission and, and Fish Health Group, we follow the guidelines that they set forth for the different state agencies and countries that are members. Free, mm -hmm. Even if it would be in wild fish. And to decrease the prevalence and okay. spreading of it. Okay, let you address my question pretty good, Brian. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you, Todd. Moving on, any other new business to bring before the board? I just have a comment of sorts of how special we have things here in Pennsylvania. We may agree, disagree. We have a lot of kind of stuff. It's just a little bit of an anecdotal story. My son-in-law, who uh, we finally have uh, brought him into our world, has become hooked on fly fishing. He's in the Air Force, lives in Alexandria, Virginia. He's gone all over us. So he just found a store down there to get some uh, equipment. Ask, is there anywhere local to go fishing? The guy said, no, go to Pennsylvania. And I think that's something that I wanted to share with everybody that's pretty special. Men the spell mentioned Penn's Creek, Pine Creek, Yellow Breaches, a couple different places. Um, and I thought that was pretty impressive. And I think, as we know, we have something special here. We'll keep working on it. And I, I just wanted to share that story with everybody in the public that we we're, we're known beyond our borders for what we have here in a way of fishing. So. You know, staff and commissioners, we can be proud of what we've got. 
Let's keep working towards making it better. So, anything else for the good of all? Hearing nothing, move to Yvonne. Time, place, or the next meeting. I'm gonna make sure you're still here. <laughs> Sorry, Evan. The next commission meeting will be January 25th and 25th, 2022. Since we've reduced to the one day meeting, that will be January the 24th. Okay, we'll, we'll, make, we'll make that decision along the way. So, on agenda items and anything. I just wanted to comment. Did she say the 24th and the 25th? We're going to hold the 24th and the 25th. Okay, well, I'd like to make the recommendation then that we try to do the same as we've done at this meeting, which is conduct all our business in one day. And, we'll, and either have the second day to go home early or to do some kind of a field visit. And we'll take a look at that at this meeting. We appreciate that. But let's let's at least put that in our calendars um, so we have that. Um, and again, we could, and at that stage of, of the year, we could have some weather related issues at Monday. You might have to do some juggling there. Rick, just in regards to the meeting, you know, and you know, this format, this modified format, uh, hybrid, you know, it's been working out in some ways. Uh, you know, like the, we had the legal meeting. I, I wasn't able to attend that online, but when I'm here, some, you know, sometimes we miss I, so, a lot of that information. I, uh, I missed that. On that uh, the habitat I was on. And that was real good, by the way, what they did. I learned a lot about road salt. But I did not, you know, I didn't get the legal aspect from, the, from some of that stuff. So, I mean, we could discuss it amongst ourselves, but um, there's a value to that. I always did, it was always a value to me. I mean, it's a lot of info. We can pare it down maybe, but uh, uh, again, going forward, I think we, you know, yeah, and, and again, a positive way to do it in some fashion so we can be more effective. But again, we're evolving from where we were last year. I think we've come a long way and I think we've hung in there pretty well. But I, I agree, Eric, that face to face and being around one another really helps to, uh, to get, get down into the weeds. All right. Anything else for the good of all? I made my closing remarks. And again, thanks to everybody. Uh, a, a great meeting. And um, with that, do I have a motion to adjourn? <laughs> Don, I heard you first. Seconded by Commissioner Ali. Ali. All those in favor, yell and say aye. Aye. All right. Thank you all. Thank you for your leadership, Rick.